Welcome guys, welcome to the BEC session 1. Today is really gonna be a rocking, rocking day for you because we'll be kickstarting our journey for the BEC and uh, I can tell you, you know, from the, from the business environment and concept standpoint, uh, this subject really prepares you to become the leader of any organization. To give you some, some um, insights into, in terms of, you know, what we'll be covering, you know, BEC basically has three important pillars uh, that we'll be covering over a period of time. On one side of it, it will really prepare you from the uh, risk and the governance standpoint. On the other side, it would prepare you from the, uh, from the standpoint of becoming the analytical person of your organization. So they will, will be talking on various financial management techniques, the cost leadership techniques and cost management techniques in terms of you know, what you really need to have. And many of these things you would have already seen. So it's, we'll not be talking anything new, but many of the things you would have already seen, you know, because very generic things and very, uh, I would say, common things from the financial management or the risk management or the cost management standpoint is something that we'll be learning over there. We would also learn some bit of economics on this in terms of, you know, how the, the economics really works in the industry. So we'll be also touching upon that in the BEC just to get in perspective in terms of, you know, how the organization or organizational behavior really, really works on in the environment we really operate in. So we'll be talking on that too. And the third, which I think is going to be the most important and the relevant piece for all of you is going to be the technology. So BEC also entail a technological pillar, which really, uh, you know, would want you to know many of the technological nuances that you really want to get into and really uh, would be looking forward to or really uh, dealing with as you may go forward, uh, because we are all exposed to the technological changes nowadays. So we all have to deal in with that on day in and day out basis. And though, since we have to deal in with that, we have to know that. And of course, we have to see the repercussion of that that would have that we would have as an individual, we would have as an organization. And if we would have that, then how one would be dealing with that and of course, controlling that and working on that and so on and so forth. So these three important pillars are something that we'll be covering in BEC as a, as a whole. And of course, alongside, we'll be practicing a lot of questions also in parallel to just ensure that, you know, we really get a sense of, you know, how the examiner would be testing us on that. And then, you know, of course, we'll be really preparing ourselves from, for some of the mock exam and of course, hitting the exam in the best possible way. That's what we'll be covering in, in totality in the, in the BEC as a whole. And that's what, you know, our plan would be to really kill the, kill the CPA exam in the best possible way. Does that sound like a plan? Yes, sir. I do want to, you know, spend time in terms of uh, giving you perspective about, you know, what we'll be covering today. You know, I have in store today our session one that basically would. Uh, uh, so if I really talk upon, you know, what I really intended to cover in, in you know, in, in session one in totality, I really want to talk on the corporate governance as uh, on one side of it and on the and on the other side of it, the basics of the financial management. So the way we have structured uh, this this entire you know uh, overall topic is that today we'll be covering the entire corporate governance piece. So there are various things that we'll be covering, and I'm sure you know you being part of various organizations, you know how the the governance of an you know of an organization is really important for them. How important it is to have the smart. Uh, risk management framework being available, you, how important it is to really have the strong operating model for the risk being available for that organization to ensure that everything that is happening uh, in the in the company is really taken care or really, you know, somewhat somewhere uh, done in a way that is expected. Uh, and of course, it is controlled in a way to ensure that, you know, nothing really goes wrong over there. And that's what we'll be learning and we'll be starting from the scratch. We'll be, and you, uh, you would understand that, you know, when we'll really go through and of course do all of these topics, there'll be many of the things that will be very limited because we'll touch upon very, you know, basic things. And then we'll build on in terms of, you know, how the examiner really want to us, you know, want to test us on, on, on all of those lines. Corporate governance per se, if I really talk about, you know, these topics from the examination parallels, these topics from the examinations, you know, important standpoint are really important. You generally get at least 10 to 12 MCQs out of out of these two areas, you know, which is like corporate governance and the financial risk management, which effectively means around 12 to 15 percent of your total exams comes out of this. And if there is something that really comes out in the simulation out of this or in the writing part out of this, it really adds up a different value to it. 
governance as an organization is really important we all know that governance as an individual is also really important we have to really accept that fact and of course work on that and ensure that we are not missing out on it and of course we have to have the best practices amongst us in our cells in our blood to ensure that we are not missing on to all of those nuances and that's what we'll be covering that's what i intend to you know circle down and of course have it for you if i really you know get into the details of it in terms of you know what is there in the in the syllabus area as far as you know what we you know intend to cover today or you know we'll be covering in this we'll be touching upon various internal control frameworks so we'll we really want to talk on you know what the internal control is how important it is for an organization again the basic as i said we'll be talking about the various frameworks the 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 subset of that would be the enterprise risk management framework the coso model in terms of you know what the coso really says for you to have a risk management framework how important it is for you to really know that you know this is the risk you know management framework that exists in an organization what kind of changes are needed how do you really make that change and so on and so forth so that is again something that we'll be covering and who knows the serbens oxley if you're working for a us company if you are then you would certainly certainly know the serbens oxley right serbens oxley was the advent of the fraud that really happened in us at 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 some point in time in year 2001 2002 and 2000 for that matter there were various frauds that happened that used to happen or that happened that point in time which really made and shook the us government to take the right uh, step in the direction of framing up a law and the, you know the serbens oxley is that law it is very important and very imperative you know you being part of any us corporation to really know this and understand this and implement this in your own organization there are various uh, cases that we'll be discussing on ongoing basis in our sessions to give you a practical insight of you know what has what has worked for various organization and what has not worked for various organization i do have one case to be discussed today i i you know and, and i just I'll, i'll bring a slide in a while wherein we'll start off with various things that we really needed to know from the standpoint of what the governance of an organization is and how important it is for an organization to not to do what the case what happened in that particular case and i'm talking about worldcom my friend we'll touch upon that in a while in terms of you know what that is but what happened in worldcom was again a function of you know what really didn't worked well from the governance standpoint over there we'll touch about that in a while but stay on hold on to your seats we'll really get in there and after that we'll also want to touch upon the business processes you know we uh, we pay, you know we all know processes right whether it is account receivable accounts payable the payroll the hr we all know that right now over here we'll probably you know have a quick glance of you know what kind of processes are there how are you really thinking about those processes what kind of things you really need to know from those processes standpoint how do you really need to have synergies in these processes controls in these processes and so on and so forth so it's more like understanding the processes and of course the management of it both of that is something that we'll be understanding and of course correlating to and towards the end you know we do want to cover the financial risk management and the risk management again you know part 1 part 2 uh, you know it's it's more like you know this is this is the this will be the starting point for you to to understand uh, the financial management uh, as a subject so we'll start off with various you know small small things be it the interest be it the risk be it the simple interest compound interest effective rate of interest annual interest and so on and so forth so we'll start off with that and then we'll build upon that to you know cover all of these topics in in one session is 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 something which will be too much for you so what i've done is that you know what we have done is over here is that we'll be covering first four topics which is internal control framework enterprise risk serbens ox and business processes in today's session and we'll be taking on the financial risk management next week wherein we'll be touching upon you know i would say the basics of the financial management and we'll start building on in terms of you know what we intend to cover from the fm standpoint in the next session important piece over here to know is that one of course you know when you will go through the content you will realize it yourself that you know you know you know i would say most of it is something that you are aware of but important piece for you to really understand and of course uh, consume is that you have to know in terms of how examiner can ask questions on these you know petty topics and if he really ask you then what is the right way of answering that and we'll be circling of that too you know when we'll be targeting and of course answering few of the questions also will be will be touching upon you know all of on all of those details but important piece is that all of these topics are something that we really need to know from the bc1 standpoint 
Is that clear? Yes, sir. Now, just to before we really just start and of course get on to the you know uh, get on to. Uh, you know discussing about it you know i uh, in just in the interest of time and of course just to have these sessions on track uh, you know we won't be taking any queries in between the session so we will be breaking out uh, you know uh, in some time during the session so you know in that break you know we'll be practicing few questions and of course take queries and of course towards the end also we'll be having again you know a q and a wherein we'll be taking the queries but till that time you know we you know we'll be just going to ensure that you know we are taking the best best uh, output from the time we won't be taking queries in between in between the discussions does that sound like a plan just wanted to again is do a sense check guys uh, i hope i am clearly audible guys anyone can confirm no no gaps on that right jyoti you don't you join late buddy you can hear me right Jyoti, yes, sir. Yes. See, Jyoti, I, I never forget you, right? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. All right. So before we really, you know, uh, going over there, you know, uh, there is one important piece that I, you know, I wanted to start off with, you know, today, and we'll we'll talk on the theory in detail. But one very important thing that I really want to talk on and really want to discuss on is the case of Volcom. You know what happened in WorldCom really lays the foundation of you know how the corporate governance of, of an organization should be, how important that is, and how relevant that is for you to ensure that you're not missing out on that. And for that, I have you know a slide over here that I really want to talk on, and of course discuss on. This is the slide I really want to talk on. Just look at these two gentlemen and think about: Have you ever seen them? Have you ever? Uh, somewhat somewhere known about them or read about them in some way or the other have you seen them you know know them when you would somehow somewhere uh, i would say scan and search about them you would get to know about these two gentlemen that these two gentlemen were the top notch or the leaders of a very well known organization yes my friend i'm talking about worldcom WorldCom was an organization that really got into the limelight in the era of 1980s and 90s and of course 2000 and finally went into bankruptcy in the year 2001-2 wherein the cause of that bankruptcy was these two gentlemen. Again, no offense to them, but this is what is being published. This is what is being public that these two gentlemen were behind in terms of you know what really happened in WorldCom. To give you a perspective, my friend, in terms of you know what the WorldCom did and you know how really you know what they did, the way they did, you know what happened in this in this was that WorldCom was into the uh, into the leased lines, They're the large uh, call uh, volume that they used to pick up from one country to the other. So, for example, just to give you you know a perspective in the layman's language, let's say a, you know you make a call from here to US. Now, if a call is to be made from here to US, the call, of course, if it is not going through satellite, it is going through the leased lines, which is like, you know, you pick up a call from here, the call starts from here and ends up to a seashore in India. And from like from that seashore, the calls are like there are various cables that are laid down under the sea and the calls really used to get carried on from those cables from India to, let's say, London and from London to wheresoever in US and so on and so forth. There used to be a transfer of call happening like that in between these wires. Now, this company, which is WorldCom, used to own those wires, used to own those cables, and they were like charging rentals and this and that of those cables, and they were really making huge amount of money in the area of you know in the age of 1990, you know 2000, because that point in time, internet per se was not that popular, was not that convenient to and available to to people at large. They were making huge amount of money. They were really, really, you know, going bonkers in terms of, you know, what they what they were really uh, able to deliver. And of course, the guy who is in beard over here is the Bernard Ebers. He was the CEO of, 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 of WorldCom. And what, you know, the guy who is not having beard over here is the Scott Sullivan. You know, he is the CFO. He was the CFO of, of WorldCom. And what they did at that point in time was that they made, made huge amount of money, not only for themselves, but also for, you know, for people at large. But then this, you know, then the bad time started coming on to, you know, on to them. And of course, you know, things were not going hunky dory for them. And there was a time wherein uh, revenue started falling. The cost really went up because they were in the, they, since they are into the lease lines, the, it is a very capital intensive, uh, you know, company wherein you really have to invest good amount of money onto the, onto the, uh, 
purchase of all of those lease lines, the laying down of all, all of these you know, lease lines and so on and so forth. So they were expensing huge amount of money onto it. But what happened was that Bernard was a no-nonsense guy kind of a thing. You know, he didn't like any surprises. He said that, you know, what I've committed to the fraternity, to the people at large, to the, uh, you know, public at large, that is to be delivered. And of course, Scott was, you know, you know, he was what, you know, the Bernard used to say. What they started doing was they started playing with numbers. They started playing with accounting. And that's what we really call to be management overriding the controls or doing something which is not right and so on and so forth. Governance was really taking a back seat over there. So what they did was they started capitalizing their expenses. Now I'm not getting into the details in terms of how they, how do they do it, why did not auditor really catch hold of them and so on and so forth. I'm not really getting onto the details of that. But what is really important for you to know and of course understand over here is that they started capitalizing expenses. And of course, since they were capitalizing their expenses, they were showing less expenses onto their PL and showing more profits, which effectively was never there. It kept on, kept on happening for a good amount of time till the time when internal audit team really hit at them. You know, there was an internal audit team and, you know, I do not have a, you know, a photograph of a lady over here. There was, there is a lady, you know, named Cynthia Coopers. She was the one who was heading their internal audit at that point in time, not like head of the internal audit, but she was like on a decent level in the internal audit. She really pointed out and of course reached out to Ebert's saying that you know something is not right in the numbers we are not convinced the way the PNL is being showing and so on and so forth it started off from there it really picked up the heat of the media it really picked up the heat of the directors of the people at large and rest is history in 2001 or two I think you know uh, that was the time they filed for the bankruptcy uh, you know, and of course, huge losses that that really came up, you know, to to the light of people. They effectively made huge amount, huge amount of money. You know, even towards the end of uh, you know bankruptcy, also they really made a huge amount of money. That point in time, just before the bankruptcy, they like took the dividends, they took the stock options, you know, they sold their shares and so on and so forth. There was a lot that happened that point in time, and they made huge amount of money, which they later on got caught, and of course. Uh, they were being imprisoned and you know all of them you know were being thrown out of you know into the jail and so on and so forth what is important over here you know why i'm really telling you this story is that what is really important over here is that we all should understand the importance of the governance that is there in an organization we all should be able to appreciate that governance is one thing that is something that you have to display in anything and everything that you do in an organization and that is what is expected out of you and that's what we are really kickstarting today my friend when we're talking about the corporate governance at large we're really trying to understand as to, as to what exactly is there in the governance and how you when you would step into any organization you really have to display your behavior and of course your uh, overall overall delivery when you will get into any organization there is a lot my friend that that examiner really expects out of the corporate governance if you really see the weightage of this this uh, uh, I would say this uh, chapter this really has at least 10 to 12 percent of the total exams coming out of this area which effectively means at least 10 MCQs kind of a thing are, are expected out of this area and you may get to see a, you know you know some way or the other this being tested out in a simulation too I'm not saying this this example per se, but this this topic that we'll be covering today from the corporate governance standpoint and the other areas that are very heavily tested in the exam. So buckle up your belt. We are trying to deep dive into it. Alrighty, moving on to the COSO. I'm just starting off my friend in terms of you know what we really have to cover here and what is COSO. COSO is nothing but the but the committee, my friend that is there on the sponsoring organization committee of sponsoring organization is called COSO. we all have to understand that what is really needed to understood over here is that this was being thrown up by the tradeway commission that came up in us that really wanted to point out the gaps that are there in the control environment so COSO was being formed to make sure that enterprise really understand what is really happening on the control side of it it is an independent private sector initiative. Do not forget that it is not a government organization. It is a non-governmental organization of five financial professional associations. I'm just trying to give you some theory and background behind that so that you're really aware of it. In 1992, COSO issued internal control integrated framework to assist the organization in developing a comprehensive assessment of the internal control 
and its effectiveness so called the best practices that the organization should be really working on with got it sir now what is important over here for you to really know that from the internal control standpoint there are five components to it and 17 principles and three objectives i really want to highlight this you know these are few things my friend that examiner loves testing you on he plays around with these objectives these principles and of course these components a lot of that lot of the time in the exam in the form of mcqs you really have to be aware of that the course is used by the management board of directors internal auditors why because it requires a judgment to determine the sufficiency of control since they needed that judgment course really helps us helps helps them out on that it helps them in terms of applying the proper controls my friend that they really needed to have it really helps them and of course in assessing the effectiveness of the right right control system that they really have it also helps them having a due emphasis on the importance of the management judgment what is that for you to take away from here is that you should know that coso is an organization which is really working for the benefit of organizations at large and of course helping people in all of these grounds is that clear yes sir now five components sir 17 principles and three objectives what was that sir i'm coming on to that i'm not missing on to it all right moving on my friend i have internal control framework we'll get into the details of it it is very important very you know imperative for us to really understand these principles and these these processes at large now what is internal control okay if sir we know internal control sir we are this is not new to us sir we are part of various organizations sir. i've worked for various organizations so we know that sir you know it my friend i'm sure you would know it but what is a real imperative in the cpa exam is that we are able to understand how examiner really ask us on that internal control you would have handled and of course seen and read in some way or the other in various formats and you would have somewhat somewhere uh, have written also onto it in any of the question that you would have got more of a theory based question but in the cp exam in the bc1 exam in the bc exam per se he would be giving you various questions that are to be tested and asked in the form of an mcq and that's what you really need to learn and understand in terms of how we ask that question and how you're eliminating the wrong answer choices we'll get into that and of course we'll practice that also together in terms of you know how can i really help you with that but what is really important is that we are understanding these small small things because examiner really throws out these things at you he would never give you a long long questions to be answered of course in the simulation you would get to see some but most important piece is that in the mcqs all of these questions are being asked so we'll practice on to that all right now what is internal control internal control is nothing but a process that is affected by manager governance and other personnel designated to provide reasonable assurance about the achievement of objectives now what are these objectives sir we really need to understand the objectives sir objectives of the entities are three we all know we also know it objectives of the entities are three there are three objectives there are three objectives sir why are you repeating sir i am repeating my friend because it has to get into your blood it really has to get into your blood there are three objectives of an organization number one reliability of the financial reporting you really have to know what is to be reported and what is not to be reported you really have to understand that what has not been reported and why you have to be able to challenge that so one of the objective is that you should report effectively there should be a reliability on what is being reported got sir that is the r of rock i'm just getting on to some of the mnemonics the objectives of the organizations are rock r for reliability of the financial reporting then what sir effectiveness and efficiency of operations sir we all know that sir i am made for it sir i have to handle that operations are really up to the mark there is no gap on to that yes and that's what you really need to do the effectiveness and the efficiency of operation is the second objective you have to understand the operational effectiveness now we are knowing the reporting effectiveness we are knowing the operational effectiveness moving on to the compliance objective or compliance effectiveness which is compliance and rules and regulations are to be complied with roc the regulatory effectiveness the operational effectiveness and the compliance effectiveness or objective as we may want to call it is the is the some you know is the are the objectives that you really need to be ensuring that you are having that in your mind these are the three objectives roc rock are the objectives that you really have to know you really have to have it at the back of your mind because you really really get tested on to that in the exam 
Is that clear? Sir, you are repeating that again and again, sir. I know, my friend, I am repeating that again and again to, show, to ensure that it is really getting onto your blood and you are there from the examination standpoint. All right, moving on. Effective system of internal control requires the use of judgment in determining the sufficiency and assessing the effectiveness of control. We know that, sir. This is the principle-based approach emphasizing importance of the management judgment. Remember, this is a principle-based approach. It cannot be black and white. You know, when you are applying the control, there is a judgment that is involved in it and that judgment may or may not be correct, but you should know that it is a principle-based approach. One really applies the judgment and move on. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Moving on, my friend. The COSO framework. Now we have learned, sir. We've learned there are three objectives. We will get to understand what all are the components. We know that there are five components. Okay, we get that. And then there are 17 principles that we mentioned. And that's what we'll be learning. And but this cube, the COSO cube, is all about this. The COSO framework, all about this. It says that you have you have sorry you have operations as an objective reporting as an objective and compliance as an objective we all know that these are the three objectives sir rock sir we know that sir it is in our blood sir rock are the three objectives all right then then there are five components of the internal control we have control environment we have risk assessment we have control activities don't worry we'll get into the details in a while but you really need to know in your mind in your heart that you have c you have r and then you have control activities then you have in, then you have information communication then then you have the monitoring activities we call it crime we'll get into it in a while we'll call it crime we'll call it crime we'll get into it in a while then while we are thinking about the components of the internal control there are various you know somewhat somewhere levels on which they need to be applied it can be done at the entry level sorry entity level it can be done at the divisional level it can be done at the profit you know uh, sorry operational level and it can be done at the function level so there can be various levels on which these controls are to be applied the COSO cube or the COSO framework says that you know the cube overall looks like that there are three objectives there are five components of the internal control and all of that is applied on to the various levels of organization right from the entity level to the division level, to the operational level and to the functional level at large. Is that clear? We will get into the detail of this cube in a while, but what is really imperative and important for you to really know is that this is what the COSO framework is all about. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Moving on, my friend, we have five integrated components of the internal control. We all know that, sir. And that's what you highlighted, sir. That's what you mentioned. That is nothing but the crime. Yes, my friend, I'm loving you for that. There are five important components of the internal control and that is what we call crime. Number one, that is control environment. That is the tone from the top. The component of the internal control. What is the first component of the internal control? It is nothing but the tone from the top. That is the control environment. You would do what the organization really, really believes in, what the leadership really believes in. That is what it is. For example, I'm just taking an example. For example, Wipro is a pro because what Azim Premji really thinks of is has been has been flowed down in the entire organization they are very very good in their ethics excellent in the ethics of an organization and that is the tone at the top because it is being driven from the top control control environment is being driven from the top it is the tone of the top do not do not really forget on that all right now we'll get on to the detailing of you know of this in terms of you know what this really really entails we have a control environment that is the c then we have the risk environment my friend that is the r then we have the information communication system my friend that is nothing but the but the i would say lifeline or the communication of any organization that really they have to deal with and then you have the monitoring my friend and then you have the existing control activities very important my friend that we're really understanding that we are not missing on to that because all of these these important things are being heavily tested in the exam should we go and get into the details of it yes sir all righty now like the way we have control environment we say it to be the tone at the top when we get onto the risk assessment by the management that is where management has to see that do we have any kind of misstatement or the fraudulent practices that are there in the in the overall organization they really have to understand that do you have any fraudulent or material somewhat financial statements that are there in the organization are they really really 
complying with the law or it is a law breaking kind of a thing they really have to do that in the risk assessment remember my friend we are doing the crime they do not forget that that we are doing the crime we are really going one by one on all of the components we have learned over here that there are five components control environment risk assessment control activities we can say to be existing control activities then we have information communication and then we have monitoring activities that is called crime we are doing crime we are going it one by one we are really done the control environment which is nothing but the tone at the top then we have done the risk assessment understanding that you have to do the assessment the management has to do the assessment to understand that do we have any kind of fraudulent or misstatement in the financial statement do you have the law abidance onto it or it is law breaking got it sir then then comes the information communication system this is the lifeline my friend wherein you need to understand that the fair accurate complete and the timely flow of information exists in the organization it is very important imperative that there is a smooth flow of the information all throughout the organization then comes the monitoring my friend in terms of understanding now that you have seen the tone of the top you have done the risk assessment you have seen that there is a communication channel or you have communicated that accordingly you really need to understand that what all are the deficiencies that are there these deficiencies really helps you understand that these are the gaps that are to be filled up these are the areas that you really need to be working out with and towards the end when you have really ascertained in terms of tone of the top you really understand what is really going on into the financial statement as far as the risk assessment is concerned you have really seen the information communication system of an organization you have monitored in terms of you know what all deficiencies are there then comes the existing control activities you have to see in terms of you know what kind of existing controls are there in place the current policies procedures to understand the current risks and of course take the corrective action if the need is important is that we understand that all of that is related to what the three objectives of the entity and what are the three objectives sir it is the rock sir sir nothing but the reporting operation and compliance effectiveness sir i'm loving you my friend for that the more you will do practice of that the more you will talk on this the more you will get the expertise on it is that clear yes sir moving on my friend we will start off with control environment control environment is the first is the c of crime is the c of crime we have the five components of the internal control the first one is the c that is the control environment that is the tone at the top we understand that sir now what does that mean i have given you one mnemonic over here that is eboka we have to memorize these mnemonics my friend because more you would understand this the more you will really appreciate this the more you'll be able to really memorize this because examiner throws things at you from these these i would say uh, mnemonics he throws things at you which you really need to understand as to this is part of what so we are talking now the 17 principles that are there in these components the first one being the control environment that has five principles being attached to it we call it eboka now the eboka stands for what number one the commitment to the ethics and integrity there has to be a commitment my friend to the ethics and integrity and it really flows down from the top the i would say somewhat you know the board independence and the oversight because you your board the board of the directors have to be independent they really have to have that oversight and that is not to be biased that is what is being said in the eboka yes then what then you have the organizational structure my friend all right e stands for the ethics and integrity b stand for sir board independence got it sir then comes the o which stands for organizational structure sir the structure should be should be made in a way that there are of course respective controls in place and of course there is somebody to supervise the other there are segregation of duties and what not to ensure that there is nothing being mixed missed sorry then you have the com commitment to the competence you have to have that as a lifeline of your organization that they should always always believe in hiring the competent people commitment should be there and of course they should be living this in anything and everything that they're doing and then comes the accountability it should be there all throughout the organization and that's what the entire control environment is all about that is the c 
that is the c of crime that is the component of the internal control which is being which is being termed by the five principles called eboca e stands for ethics and integrity b stands for board independence and oversight o stands for organizational structure c stands for commitment to the competence and a stands for accountability remember my friend while we may think that do you really need to memorize these uh, I would say mnemonics and you really have to live with it answer is yes because in MCQs he would really throw something at you and if you remember these mnemonics you'll be able to really ascertain that you know this really goes here and you'll be able to highlight and pick up the right option we'll practice that also my friend but it is really important is that you're really grasping the things the way it is being said without even thinking that you know how would that help you because that is certainly gonna be helping you out is that clear yes sir moving on to the rhyme now we have covered the c that is we have covered the control environment now we are moving on to the rhyme all right let's check on to that wherein r stands for risk assessment which is being which is being explained by the principle safer we have four principles over here safer i'm giving you these mnemonics my friend please please do not miss on to that very 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 imperative and important that you are not missing on to that coming on to the next one that is the information communication we have this by the mnemonic oie there are three principles in it all righty five principle of the of the control environment then four principle of the risk environment all right let's write that four of the risk three of the information and communication moving on to monitoring we have two principles over here by the name sod we have a mnemonic sod okay we have two over here we'll just get into the details of it and then in the end we have existing control activities explained by cat p we have three three principles over here all righty three so we have okay i'm so sorry we have five in control activities we have five in control activities five plus four nine nine plus three twelve and five that is 17 principles is something we should not be forgetting any which ways very very important 17 principle we should not be forgetting any which ways now going on to the risk assessment we have four principles in the risk assessment that we really need to know we have to be able to specify the objectives i'm sorry for that specify the objectives in terms of you know what is the objective of the assessment that we have we be able we should be able to identify and analyze risk all right and then we should be able to consider the potential of fraud what can go wrong in an organization and then we should be able to assess and identify the changes that are needed we are really going to be tested on this my friend in the exam and we really have to know these mnemonics to ensure that we are not missing on to it because he generally tests us on that we know that you know safer mnemonic stands for the specific or the specify objectives a stands for identify and assessing changes you know i'm not going by the sequence then you have the identification and the analysis of risk and then you have the risk stand for r in safer and then considering the potential of fraud which is the f of safer very important that we are not missing on these mnemonics he really tests you on this these are the four principles that are there in the risk assessment getting on to the information and communication my friend we have the three three object three sorry three principles over here that is o i n e we have to have to memorize that you have to know that so that you don't miss on that we have to you know by a by sorry by o we mean obtain and use information you should know it you should be able to understand that in the information and communication system one should be really be able to obtain and use the relevant information then you should be internally communicating that information that is the i of o e and then in the last we should be able to communicate with the external parties so think about you know you communicating with the external auditor are you communicating with the people at large you communicating with the press you communicating with the public at large all of that really comes up in the communication to the external parties and that is the o i and e of the information and communication very important very imperative that we are not missing on to it coming on to the monitoring activities sir sod sir there are two two principle number one ongoing or the separate evaluation that is something that you really need to have from the monitoring standpoint and that's what one should be really doing when it comes to the 
overall monitoring of the activities then the communication of the deficiencies now do you have to have to communicate the deficiencies that's the ultimate ultimate aim right when you're monitoring the activities your aim is to understand what what is really going wrong and if you really know what is going wrong then you should be able to communicate that too then comes the existing control activities that is nothing but the cat p will have to select and develop the control activities we know that's a then select and develop the technological control so control activities that are there which are which can be manual can be automated the technological control goes you know in the second in the second principle and then comes the deployment of the policies and procedures basis what you have seen what you have observed effectively if you really go through the control uh, I would say components of the control you will understand the entire life cycle of the control in terms of you know what the control should be how they should be looking like and what you should be doing that is nothing but the control activities five principles we know that that is what five principles are what are those five principles can you tell me that yes sir those five principles were evoca yes sir I love you for that then comes the risk assessment my friend there are four principles that is nothing but the safer we know that sir then comes the information and communication sir how many principles there three principles there what was that that is o e o i n e coming on to the monitoring activities that had two principles that is s o d and then coming on to the last one which is the control activities or existing control activities that is nothing but the cat p that is the normal controls and then the technological controls and then nothing but the policies and procedures what you really need to have that what is imperative over here is my friend that you're really really uh, revising this again and again again and again and again and again and not forgetting these mnemonics the more it will have in you you will have that in your blood the best it is for you to really handle those questions in your exam is that clear yes sir should we go and move out oh to the other areas yes sir we have done the crime crime are the components of the internal control we have done the 17 17 principles of the internal control that are being there in these components all right moving on what is the requirement of the inter, you know effective control there are two i would say pillars to it one is of course to have the general requirement my friend and then to have the specific requirement what is the general requirement we all know that sir the general requirement of any control is nothing but the five components and the 17 principles that is the basic need that one would have one would need to have from the standpoint of having and ensuring that controls are there and they're working effectively all the components and principles that are relevant should be present and designed and implemented in the internal controls and that is the general requirement we all understand that sir and then operating as designed in the internal control system now you may have a control my friend but is it working effectively or not you have to test that you have to understand that so you really have to do a design check of it that you know the way it is being structured is it right and then the way it is being designed is it really operating effectively or not so you have to do that check to ensure that you're really you're really having a full grasp of you know having an effective control and then all the components should work together as an integrated system to reduce risk to an acceptable level i'll give an example to it my friend i have seen and this is something that is also relevant from the surveillance oxer standpoint in your organization whatsoever organization you're part of there would be a process of any visitor coming on to your office right the visitor would come on to the uh, come on to the uh, the the uh, i would say the ground level wherein the, you would have a guard sitting out here and they would be like entering your name and maybe taking your credentials your uh, id proof and all of that right scanning that and of course having that as a cup you know copy for them and then that person goes from lift to you know respective respective floor then the person gets out and of course gets into the organizational help desk or reception then on the reception the re the receptionist takes care of you know who the person is and of course then he is introduced to somebody and you know the person comes up the, and the you know the escort happens and of course the you know the entire process works out now this is the control right the control that only legitimate person should enter into you know uh, uh, enter, into, enter into premises now from the design of control the way it is being designed guard having there receptionist having there you know checking xyz things and so on and so forth it seems that everything is effective so first is to check the design that you know is it effective design is, can you buy bypass this so from the designing perspective everything is fine but then comes the effectiveness can somebody get into the lift without you know uh, signing that register in front of a guard if there is a possibility that you can really get out and get into a lift without having a sign off with a guard there is a big time problem there then while the control is designed properly it is not working effectively 
because you have some lacunas, you have some gaps into it. So on one side, you have to check that, you know, what is really working out, what is really happening. And on the other side, you have to check that, you know, is that working fine? Is there a gap there? Is there a lacuna there? If yes, then you have to correct that. And that's what this is all about, that you really have to understand that all the five components, 17 principles are there. Then you have to understand that design is right. Then you have to understand that they're working effectively and they're working as an integrated model. So it should, it should not happen that, you know, guard is doing the job, but receptionist is not. Or you, you have a, uh, you know, swipe in, swipe out and, you know, the, the guard, the gate gets open because there is a swipe in and then swipe out. But that is not working effectively and you can use, you know, uh, the, the, the closure and the opening is not happening, you know, in, in, in the right way and people are really passing by. That should not be a problem. So you really have to see whenever there is any, I'm just taking, I've just, I've just taken this example, but what you really need to see is that uh, you have to understand that, you know, what can go wrong, what are there as control, is that okay from the designing standpoint, is that okay in terms of implementation, is it working effectively, is it working effectively holistically from the integrated standpoint and so on and so forth. Is that clear? Yes, sir. From the specific requirement standpoint, you have to understand what? As per the organizational achievement objective, efficiently and effectively, that is the ORC. Now, many organizations would have a different objective to be achieved. Depending on that, you should have the control that really commensurate. Some organizations are very risk averse. Some organizations are very open to the risk. You really have to understand what is the philosophy of an organization. And depending upon that, you would lay down the relevant controls onto it. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Now, moving on, my friend, the COSO framework and the audit framework. I just wanted that to be here more to understand, to give you a perspective as to what this is all about. All right. From the COSO framework standpoint, what you do is you identify, you, you basically have what? Identity and evaluate an organization, null internal control. You basically understand that, you know, you identify and of course, evaluate. That's what you do, right? Identify and evaluate what the internal control is. But from the audit standpoint, what you do is you focus on the given control and see that it prevents, detects and corrects the material misstatement in the entity's financial reporting. From the audit framework standpoint, what you do is I would say it focuses on how this is happening, how this is controlling. So somewhat I would say COSO framework gives you, you know, that do you have an internal control or not, but audit really get into a step forward to understand that you know how a given control what is being defined by COSO is working effectively how it is really ensuring that there is no material misstatement getting on into the financial statement I just wanted that to be here I'm sure you would understand this but I just wanted to pin down here just to make sure that you're not missing out on that all right moving on my friend I do want to talk on some of the limitations that the internal control has we'll quickly go and wrap this up because this is something we already know internal control limitations are there while we all want internal controls but in having an internal control in an organization doesn't mean that nothing will go wrong there can be various things that can go wrong despite having internal control why because it doesn't prevent bad decisions you can still make a bad decision right I can still go wrong right Despite having strong internal controls, I may not make the right decision for an organization and things have gone wrong. Then eliminate all external events that may prevent the achievement of the organization objective. It may happen that it may eliminate all external events. It may happen, right? Some inherent limitation may exist even if there is an effective control of in, in, you know, in, in internal control system. What? Breakdown of internal control. It happens, right? You know, uh, your electricity is not working. Your gates are not opening, closing. You have an external external breakdown that has happened, which has really not led to the implementation of the right internal control. There can be a faulty judgment. Control implementation is, is somewhat somewhere dependent on you know on you taking a you know a judgment at that point in time, which may or may not be right. It can be concerned. Issues with the suitability to the organizational objective. One of the organization is very discoverse, the other one is very, very aggressive. There cannot be one set of internal control that can be applied to both. If you apply it, there can be a gap. Circumvention of control through collusion management 
override of internal control who doesn't know what come over here we know that sir that is now in our blood we understand that if there is a collusion if there is an override of control then also internal control framework will go for a toss and we can get to see something like worldcom we'll also talk on enron in a while because enron is also one of the important area that you should be knowing there are various components of you know the the, the content that we'll we'll do together we'll understand that you know things are really going on you know how things can really go wrong if people are not doing what they're supposed to do is that clear yes sir now coming on to the applying internal control framework if they if you really are thinking about applying the internal control framework then how should you do one has to do what one has to do the overall assessment my friend you have to assess how the overall internal controls are looking like you have to do the component evaluation to understand that you know uh, how each and every component of uh, you know of the course of framework is to be taken care of you have to do the principal evaluation and then summary of internal control deficiency is something that you need to prepare to ensure that you have what you have a management who compile and document the internal control with the support of course of framework what is really important is that every management should be able to do that should be able to apply compile and document what is there in these in the company as far as the existing controls are concerned then they should do their overall assessment they should have the component evaluation done of each and every component of the internal control they should do the principal evaluation of what is there and what it's what it's what it should be and then there should be a summary of internal control deficiencies that they should prepare and then they should work on to that very generic thing but we should somewhat somewhere know that you know we have to apply the internal control why to apply because you have to you know somewhat uh, evaluate the effectiveness you have to understand that you know what kind of deficiencies are there you have to understand that you know you have to manage the, you know the you have to manage it on the overall basis you have to understand that there is an intent to reduce the assessed risk to the to the minimum level or to the accepted level you would learn all of these things also my friend in detail when you will get into the audit you know syllabus area but what is really important is that for now we should know that our intent is to reduce the assessed risk to the minimum level or to the accepted level and for that we will do anything and everything and for that what we really need to do is that we should have the effective implementation of the internal control which means that you need to have the overall assessment of the current system we should have the component evaluation of various components we should know that you know there is a principal evaluation that is to be done for the organization at large and then we should be able to understand that which all of the deficiencies that are there and we should be able to correct it very generic we all understand that but it is imperative for us to really have a you know a recap of that again and again so that we're not missing on to that some of the common risk my friend that are being identified in coso i think it, you know for you what you know if you do not have a you know internal control what can go wrong let's go wild on that if the internal control you know is not there or control systems are not there or coso is not there what can go wrong is that you may have a material omission or the misstatement or and you know that and that can be unintentional right we didn't plan for it it was not a worldcom case we didn't plan for it but things have gone wrong because we didn't anticipated that there can be a fraud my friend what happened in worldcom right there is a, there, was, there, there can be fraud right you're doing that intentionally there can be a big time issue management override any control again your know, personal gain right you know what happened what bernard ebers did right what scott did you know for their own money right they really need the dividends they really need the the shares to be sold at a higher price so they didn't wanted the share price to fall and of course they were giving wrong profits no not dancer illegal act violation of the government regulation what happened in worldcom was again something that is illegal you can't do that you can't deceive deceive people like this you cannot cannot do that again to manage all these risk <coughs> management select develop and implement control in response to the assessed risk for this purpose management considers what very generic my friend we understand that they consider the laws and the rules of the related relate you know related to the entity the nature of the business of the organization the competence of the personnel and of course technology that is being used very generic thing my friend but what is imperative over here that we understand that these are the things that you should be having in your mind when you're really thinking about applying a control in any organization is that clear yes sir moving on my friend moving on to the enterprise risk management framework that is erm enterprise risk management framework again this is i would say somewhat somewhere the subset of the overall overall internal control system internal control system we should know this we should understand this and we should be able to implement this in any organization we are part of 
Is that clear? Yes, sir. Should we go and check this out? Yes, sir. Enterprise Risk Management Framework, the year M. This was issued by COSO in 2004 as Enterprise Risk Management. We know that when it was to deal with what? Integrated Framework and now it has been updated, my friend, in 2017 as integrated with strategy and performance effectively this got issued in 2004 and then it got updated my friend in 2017 do not do not do not forget that the purpose of erm to help management in developing a comprehensive response to the risk management very important that we know effectively coso came up to give you a risk management process an erm to ensure that you are able to really understand the risks that are there in your in your company and you are able to control that all right to in response to risk management and in formulating a strategy to balance risk and return so that organization can do what we all know that sir effectively deal with the uncertainty that's the basic principle basic premise and evaluate the risk acceptance and build value it's more to understand you know in terms of you know what is the level of risk i'm accepting i'm living with balance the risk and return with efficiency and effectiveness in accomplishing what the objective in terms of how to invest capital and risk constraint very generic my friend but in turn we all understand that one of the benefit of the risk management is to understand as to what can go wrong how can it go wrong to what an extent to what extent and of course what should i be doing with that at now at you know right now at this point in time all right sir moving on moving on my friend we have how do we evaluate in erm again very generic thing but very basic thing that we need to understand one has to understand the entity's willingness to bear the risk got it how the entity will respond to the risk you really have to understand the intention of the organization in terms of how and what they're really intending to do with that all right event identification now what all are the opportunities and the risks in the organization very important and very imperative for you to really step into any organization and start understanding what can go wrong. The moment you'll understand and start asking yourself why is, the more you would be able to understand and appreciate as to what all things can go wrong in that particular company and you would be able to guide the leadership, guide the leaders, guide the, I would say the overall management of an organization in a much better fashion. All right. The early identification will help to reduce surprise and losses. Good without saying, we all know that. Appropriate response to unique and common risks. You have to, you know, you may find out various risks that are there, but you really have to find out what is the, what is the right response to all of those risks. Know the entity's strength and weaknesses to capitalize on the opportunities. More you'll understand that, more you'll tell them that, you know, this is what it is going to be and this is what they should be doing. For example, is the Cynthia Cooper, when, you know, I'm, I'm going back to the WorldCom case. When she realized that you know something is going wrong, what she wanted to understand was that she went to the management, you know, disclosing that. So it's more like you know the information and communication really happening. And of course, once that has happened, one would do the complete analysis in terms of you know what all things are there, what has gone wrong, what all of the strengths and the opportunities that are being available, and so on and so forth. So when you see the risk, you see all of those components in totality. Develop a strategy to maximize the benefits of the capital investment and minimize the risk. It's very generic. We understand that, sir. Moving on. Moving on. ERM really helps you. ERM really helps you in CPR. Again, a mnemonic, my friend. You know, these all mnemonics somewhat, somewhere would be tested in your exam, my friend. That is the reason I keep saying that like a broken record. I'm sure you'll hear this you know hear me saying this again and again that you should not undermine the importance of these mnemonics erm really helps you in what in value creation which is the c in value preservation which is the p in value erosion which is the e and in value realization which is the r so CPR is something that ERM really helps you out with to ensure that you're not, not really missing on onto that. The purpose of the, each organization is to provide the value to its stakeholders. And for this ERM helps the management, helps the management to take the decisions of CPR. All right, value creation. How does that help? Return on the invested capital. So that cost of capital is always less than the benefit. You should you it's a, it's a basic cost benefit analysis. Your benefit should be more than the cost, and that's what you know. ERM really helps you derive. ERM really helps you have 
it in your organization. All right, value preservation, which, which is like sustaining operating profit by performing ongoing operation efficient, efficiently and effectively. Now, this is, you know, value preservation is something which is very common nowadays. And uh, many of the folks, again, I'm just trying to make it more relatable to it. But many of the organizations have now started looking on to things beyond profit. They really want to see that, you know, how things can go wrong if they're not thinking about the environment. So it's more like sustainable reporting kind of a thing. They are now really thinking about, you know, what is the damage that a company is doing to the environment, to the earth, to the water and so on and so forth. So they are really trying to uh, capture that or understand that and of course take the right action for that. Important is that you are really, really having the strong ERM that helps you to understand how value of an organization is being preserved. It's more like how your operations are being effectively and efficiently managed, not only from the profitability standpoint, but also more holistically from the environment standpoint too. Again, I'm just adding a layer to it while it is not, not to be just taken up uh, in the direction of a value creation, but it is to be you know, uh, considered in the if you're from the point of view that you are able to contribute to the environment to the best extent possible. Got it, sir. Value erosion to ensure, ensure what? There is no erosion of value due to faulty strategy and inefficient operation. So if you would have that kind of a system available that would highlight something like this, you'll be able to have the minim you will be able to minimize the damage that you have or loss that you would incur at that point in time. Value realization, value received by the stakeholders, either in the form of dividend or in the form of capital gain. Again, that is again something that is relevant that all of us would really need to understand. Meaning of value is what? For profit making organization, value means strategy to balance market opportunities against the risk with course without saying sir for not for profit organization or government entities. That is what is the value there? The inflows should be more than the outflows that would lead to value and that is to be future oriented because that should keep coming that should not be a one time event profit organization would always look for you know of course re having rewards more than more than uh, you know the cost but not for profit organization would always look for that you know the inflows you know, that is really coming to the organizations are more than the outflows is that difficult no sir sir we are fintrammer sir nothing is difficult for us sir we will get into it and things are really getting into our blood all right so the organization should have mission, which is objective, that is called why, and a vision, which is strategy, that is called what. The organization should have this. And of course, they should have a core value, which is ethics, culture, and belief. That is how. So you should have why, you should have what, and you should have how to ensure that all of these things are taken care. Why means you should have an objective so that organization should have a mission. Your mission is your objective and you should have it. And then comes your strategy, which is like how one you would achieve, how you would achieve it. So you have to understand to create value for its stakeholders and to have a core value, which is nothing but having an ethics, culture and belief. And that is what the how would be. Very basic things, my friend, but it is important that we are able to have this thing fitted onto our mind that we have done the internal control. We know the risk now. We're talking about COSO. We have done COSO. We now are moving on to the enterprise risk management as to what one should be doing at the enterprise level. How would that be done? What kind of things an organization needs to do? And so on and so forth. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Moving on, my friend. We have what is ERM? I really want to circle that down because that's the basic thing that you really need to have it at the back of your mind. As defined by COSO, enterprise risk management is nothing. You know, what is the risk management? What, you know, ERM, what is that? That is nothing but what? The culture, capabilities and practices and integrated with strategy setting and performance of the organization, relying on the managing risk in creating, preserving and realizing value important piece is that you have a system in place that deals with what that deals with culture of course you have a culture of an organization which has core values you know, so maybe a risk averse guys or a risk taker guys you know that would define you know kind of erm that you would have in an organization the capabilities in terms of competitive advantage or any kind of advantage that you currently have or processes that you currently have in terms of ensuring that you have the capabilities of managing the operations in the best possible way or not all right then what you may have practices, my friend, anything that you have been doing or continually applying, 
in terms of you know things that you are doing on the ongoing basis if that is there then that is also part of your aim and then integrating integration with the strategy and performance why do you exist what is your vision and strategy again you know the why the how and the what piece of it really comp you know comprises of you know what the erm would be made of or comprise of the mission and the value correlate with the strategy and the business objective it goes without saying ultimately your mission your objective somewhat somewhere should relate to the the overall overall objective of the firm there are few areas my friend which you may need to uh, uh, you know take it on a piecemeal basis because it is more of a theory over here but with the examples that we would do with the practical discussions that we would have it would be much easier for you to really have that in your mind when you would hit the exam but one thing that you should not forget not forget and not forget is that these mnemonics are of super important things mnemonics are being given and defined for you to ensure that you are not missing on the important things from the mcq standpoint very important from the examination standpoint my friend do not do not undermine the importance of that is that clear yes sir moving on to managing the risk let's go and not start managing it all right an organization must continually what review and manage the types and amount of risk it is willing to accept in its pursuit of value taking into consideration the mission and the vision of the entity got it sir you should have what a reasonable expectation my friend it will be dependent on the risk assumed now you cannot you know let let's take an example i am a risk averse organization you know i do not want risk to be there or i want to minimize the risk so i would need to invest more and more on and more on the control activities to ensure that i am really getting the least risk possible on the other hand you know i am a risk taking organization i am more you know open to taking risk and all of that i really want to see the profits you know for example you you being an investor right you know you being a risk averse investor you may you know invest in government securities but then you would get less return right because you are investing in the government securities but if you are a risk taker you want to invest in the stock market you want to invest in the futures the options and so on and so forth so you are really taking the risk over there if you are really taking the risk over there you would get more return but you have more risk over there so it really depends on the kind of organization you are really part of and that would that would somewhat somewhere relate to how you are managing the risk or how much risk you can manage all right you have to understand the risk appetite now i can be a person who is investing in the government securities or i can be a person who is investing into the stock the stocks the futures the option my risk appetite is certainly certainly going to be impacting the kind of risk that i am getting exposed to the willingness to assume risk for an organization that is mission and the vision so what is the vision and the mission that i have and then relationship of values and the risk appetite now directly related him you know directly related this is which is where the risk is which risk assumes is independent variable and expected return is the dependent variable we all understand that the more you would take the risk the more return you would get so you have a dependency on the expected it of the expected return on the risk that you're assuming very basic things my friend i do not see that there you know these are the things that would be new to you but we really need to understand that examiner wants you to know this and how he would throw a question at you in terms of these areas and how you would answer that we'll see that when you'll practice questions but important is that we should understand that you know this is how the content and the material really says us to be prepared for is that clear yes sir moving on erm must consider now you are thinking about an erm of an organization now that should must must consider what the risk inventory all the risk that can be impacting the, the entity got it sir the reasonable expectation again balancing right how much risk i want to take and how taking this risk how much i can expect there should be a reasonableness the amount of risk of having strategy and business objective that is appropriate for an entity recognizing that no one can predict risk with precision so you really have to be reasonable in terms of your expectation that somewhat somewhere we have to live with it come what may all right business context factors that may influence clarify or change an entity's current and future strategy or a business objective risk capacity the maximum amount of risk that an entity can absorb from the strategy and objective standpoint risk profile which include risk appetite determining and assessing risk as per the nature of business of the organization entity wide risk use portfolio view related areas include the ability of entity to absorb risk in its ongoing management effort so it's more like you know you really have to be uh, somewhat somewhere you know understand in terms of you know how an entity should be should be uh, somewhat relating to all of these areas to ensure that you're taking the or you're defining the right erm 
considering the you know the entity's objectives and the mission statement that they have the portfolio view a composite view of the risk and of course what entity is really facing off the organizational sustainability ability of an entity to withstand the impact of large scale event you really have to understand i'll give you a classical example on that you know i have seen a very practical example uh, coming on on these lines wherein we had a uh, uh, an oil company having an oil rigs under the sea and uh, you know though one of the oil rigs uh, you know, got opened up and i'm talking about a company which i can really now name off is the british petroleum now let's say you know they had an oil rig really that that really uh, you know got bursted under the sea due to which l various aquatic and you know animals and of course fishes and you know uh, various other uh, uh, i would say see see uh, the, the 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 animals you know in the sea got impacted and they died and of course you know on the seashore it was all black and this and that that you know that point in time bp was fined like you know nth million dollars kind of a thing now this is what the operational sustainability is all about you really have to understand you know how sustainable or how operationally uh, you are sustainable from the standpoint of the business that you're in in order to decide what is the right course of action and what should be the right erm for yourself again an example to really have that stick onto your mind the performance management the measurement of the efforts to achieve and exceed the strategy and the business objective and again you know enterprise risk management relationship which is here i include all activities components of the organization that performs linked effort to achieve goals and ultimately enhance the value of the stakeholders again a theory my friend but what is important is that if you're thinking about having an erm for your organization you should know all of these factors that they are to be considered for defining the right erm for an organization at large is that clear yes sir moving on my friend we have the components of the erm now remember my friend we did the components of the internal control right we did that there are five components of the internal control and then we did the 17 principles of the internal control when we did that effectively we were doing the erm you know even at that point in time because erm is based on what we have learned as the component of the internal control and the principles of what we have learned under the mnemonic crime we've already done that but now erm has been specifically defined by coso having five interrelated components and 20 risk management principles again we need to know this again we need to have that at the back of our mind because while this is very similar to what we have seen in the internal control per se but many of the times you would see a question coming directly on erm so you really need to know that you know these are the principles that are there in erm and these are the you know somewhat components of the erm that we really need to know so from the um, i would say from the uh, terminology standpoint they may be different but from the uh, overall theme theme standpoint you know most of the components and the and the principles are the same of what we have learned in the internal control let's go and check it out i have you know again we have given you various mnemonics on to it just to make sure that you're not missing on that but what is really imperative over here is that we know we really need to know all of this to ensure that we are hitting the exam in the best possible way should we go and check this out yes sir moving on to the first component which is governance and culture so there are five components my friend and we have a mnemonic called go pro go pro all right the first one sir goals sorry governance and culture we governance and culture sir what is this dubs will come on to that for, for now governance and culture is the first first component then what strategy and objective setting again a second component objective setting and strategy not to miss on to that again third one performance performance is the third component of the erm okay review and revision sir fourth component of the erm and then information communication and reporting which is an ongoing basis is the fifth component of the of the erm important and imperative my friend is that we should know that gopro stands for all of these these components we know that we have that at the back of our mind which is governance and culture the strategy and objective setting the performance the review and revision and information communication and reporting we all understand this sir these are like normal normal processes that we have seen from the standpoint of having a strong system of internal control we understand that sir and that's what we'll be doing and of course learning over here now moving on to the first component my friend that is governance and culture we have doves under it let's go and check that out all right now we remember we did the control control there when we did the 
overall overall five components of internal control first of that was the tone at the top now over here also my friend governance and culture says the same that is nothing but the tone at the top that really lies over here we have five principles underlying these these comp sorry this component of governance and culture which is what d stands for defining the desired culture it's more like you know you really have to define what is the desired culture for an organization of course thinking about the tone at the top then comes to exercise the board oversight you have to have right board oversight being available and that is something you should be really having in the in the governance and culture then coming on to demonstration commitment to core values the values and the beliefs of the management is going to be the game changer is going to be your outer limit or the framework that you really need to have from the standpoint of ensuring that you are having the right governance and culture and that's why this is one of the principle of the governance and culture remember there are five five components of the erm we have done the gopro we know that we are doing the g with that is the governance and culture and we have five five i would say com uh, sorry principles of this component we are doing the doves d stands for defining the desired result o stands for having the board oversight v stands for demonstration to the core values coming on to e attract develop and retain capable individual employees now you may get a question in the exam my friend wherein they, he gives you that what is this relate to so he gives you that you know you are really hiring the right talent and of course uh, trying to you know ensure that you know you are uh, attracting the right one and developing them and working on them and this and that now this relates to what as in which value or this relates to uh, which component and he'll give you like you know the gopro as component you have to take one so in that you should know that you know the gopro out, out of gopro g is the governance and culture and in the governance and culture you know there is a uh, there is a doves as as the as the principles that are there and out of that e stands for you know attracting the 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 de and developing the, and retaining the right talent you should know that once you know it you can simply go and you know click i would say tick you know if if it is a principle you will be able you will be able to you know uh, just go and and click the governance and culture over there and you will say that you know this is what it relates to i know it sir i am really aware of that i am just trying to you know showcase you my friend in terms of how examiner may ask you a question on that very important is that we are able to understand all of these you know mnemonics all of these nuances the more will be prepared for it the more will be able to handle that in the best possible way is that clear yes sir coming on to the s my friend which is nothing but establishing the right operating structure this is what dubs is all about these are the principles my friend these five are the principles that are there in the governance and culture that we really need to know we really need to memorize that to ensure that we are not missing on any of the mcqs that will be thrown at us is that clear yes sir moving on to the strategy on the objective setting my friend we are now on the o of gopro my friend we are dealing with the strategy and objective setting which is nothing but the mission vision or defining the risk appetite in terms of how much risk you want to assume what is the what is the appetite that you really have we have four principles over here s stands for evaluating the alternative strategy you'll understand you'll you know assess you'll i would say somewhat somewhere brainstorm on the kind of kind of strategies that are available to you you know taking more taking less how much i would really want to assume what should be my appetite and so on so forth then formulating the business objective considering that i would be really really doing and setting up of you know what my business objectives should be and then analyzing my friend the business context to it giving the business color to it you cannot have a strategy being in place unless and until you have really given that color color of the business business context the more you'll do that the better you are from the standpoint of having the right erm for the organization that you are part of then coming on to the r which is nothing but defining the recipe right once you have done that once i know that you know these are the alternative strategies that are being available once i know that this is my objective this is going to be uh, relevant from the business context that we are in then you are able to understand that you know this is the risk appetite that i have this is the risk i would uh, level of risk that i would want to assume and i will live with it i will love with it 
Is that clear? Yes sir. Now that stands for sore my friend. Sore is the, is the area that I really need to know from the strategy and objective setting standpoint. This is the second, second component that we've done out of GoPro, which is nothing but the strategy and objective setting. We know that SOAR really comes in over here, wherein S stands for evaluating the strategy, O stands for formulating the business objective, <coughs> and A stands for analyzing the business, I would say, context to the various risks that we have and R stand for defining the risk appetite. Do not, do not forget this my friend, SOAR is your, your, I would say, uh, SWOT to deal with any area that really comes on from the standpoint of strategy and objective setting in the exam. Is that clear? Yes sir. Moving on to the P of GoPro, all right, we have performance over here that is nothing but evaluating and having a response to the risk, all right. You would need to evaluate my friend in terms of you know how the overall performance of an organization is and then understand you know the kind of risk we are exposed to and then respond back all right you have to develop what a portfolio view in terms of you know how uh, you know a port you know as an organization how are you really you know having uh, a view on you know on, on various you know part and parcels of an organization you really have to assess the severity of the risk that is available and you have to prioritize the risk very important my friend the prioritization really comes under the performance component do not do not forget on that and i stands for identifying the risks that are there and r stands for implementing the risk responses important pieces that we are able to understand performance is basically now assessing and then responding assessing and then responding assessing and then responding and that is the reason we have to learn this mnemonic which is VAPER, V-A-P-I-R, wherein V stands for having the portfolio view, A stands for assessing the severity, P stands for prioritizing, I stands for identifying the risk and R stands for implementing the risk responses. The more and more I'm speaking on this and repeating this, repeating this and repeating this is to ensure that you're not missing out on that because examiner loves testing on this. He loves testing on these, these components and the principles. Do not, do not really forget on that. We have done the P of GoPro, the G done, O done, P done. We are going on to what? We are going on to the R, the review and the revision. I'm sorry, the review and the revision, wherein you'll be assessing what changes and pursue the improvement. You're basically now heading towards, you know, adding a value now back any improvement area that is to be really taken care of or to be managed you are now working on to that in the direction you have a mnemonic over here that is sir okay s stands for assesses the substantial change you will assess what change is needed then what pursue the improvement in enterprise risk management and reviews the risk and performance on the ongoing basis once I've done the performance component, once I've done the performance in terms of overall analyzing, in terms of you know what is or what all is happening in the organization, then comes the review and revision. I'll understand now. I would really implement or suggest the improvement, and then I will I would keep reviewing the risk and the performance on the ongoing basis. That is gonna be the basic. What is the mantra? What is the mnemonic that we follow, sir? We'll follow sir over here, where S stands for substantial change assessment. All right. I stands for improvement in the enterprise risk management. We have to pursue that. And R stands for reviewing the risk and performance on the ongoing basis. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Coming on to what? Coming on to the next one, my friend. We have information communication and reporting. Information communication and reporting the mnemonic is tip over here wherein t stands for t stands for leveraging information and technology how can i let you go and control the risk unless and until you have leveraged the right technology in the right manner do not forget on that i communicate the risk and <coughs> risk information you have to communicate the risk information in the best possible way you have to understand that you have to know it and p stands for report on risk culture and performance it's more like you have to have to somewhere report on the kind of risks that are really happening in the organization and report on to the performance of the overall organization per se. The more you'll understand the risk that an organization is really exposed to, the more you'll understand in terms of how the performance is happening, the more you'll understand in terms of you know where things can go wrong or have been going wrong, you'll be able to suggest the right course of action and then comes the communication, information and reporting of it, which is like you really need to understand the tip, understand the tip where T stands for leveraging information and technology, I stands for communicating the risk information and P stands for report on risk culture and performance. Very important guys that we are not missing on to this, very important that we are not missing on to this, very important and very relevant from the examination standpoint.
now let us go and revise this my friend because the all of these mnemonics there are so many mnemonics my friend and we tend to get confused on to that there is all the more a reason for having a continuous revision of all of these mnemonics so that we are not missing on on any of the component that may really come our way we started off with what we started off with the components of the year and we know there sir we know that we are there are five components of year and we know that now that is gopro governance and culture is one sir we know that sir then comes the strategy and objective we know that sir then comes the p that is the performance sir then comes the r which is review and the revision sir then comes the then comes the o which is ongoing ongoing what ongoing information communication that has to happen on the reporting of the risks very important my friend that you are not missing on the gopro gopro are the components of the enterprise risk management the more we know that the more we are practicing that the more we are really understanding that the best control we can have it for the organization in place all right moving on to what moving on to the first component that is go sorry that is g of the gopro which is nothing but the governance and culture we done that there are five five principles to it we did that we this is basically tone at the top we understand that sir and doves doves is something that we really need to know from the standpoint of ensuring that we are not missing on not missing on the principle where in d stands for defining the desired culture got it sir o stands for exercising the board oversight there is need to be right level of oversight e v stands for demonstration and commitment to the core values got it sir e stands for attracting developing and retaining individual employees got it sir it's more like you know investing on your employees s stands for establishing a establishing an organizational culture which is very much relevant for the organization you're dealing with all right moving on to what to the o of gopro which is nothing but strategy and objective setting got it sir we are on the gopro o objective setting okay got it then what nothing but the mission and the vision statement got it sir we have a mnemonic here that is what so is the mnemonic where s stands for evaluating the alternative strategy got it sir o stands for formulating the business objective got it sir a stands for analyzing the business context yes sir we are not missing on to that we are understanding that r stands for defining the risk appetite we understand that sir this is what the soar is all about we are we are on the o of gopro sir that is nothing but the strategy and objective setting all right moving on moving on to the p the gopro p gopro p got it sir performance wherein you have to evaluate and respond to the risk got it sir what is the mnemonic vapor is the mnemonic v stands for having a portfolio view a stands for assessing the risk got <coughs> sorry p stands for prioritizing the risk all right i stands for identifying the risk and r stands for having the right risk responses you really have to have the right risk responses there got it sir this is the p of of the gopro coming on to the r review and the revision which is like assessing the changes that are needed and of course pursue pursue of the improvement that has to happen over here we have a mnemonic here that is sir s stands for assessing a substantial change you have to see in terms of you know what kind of changes that are needed we will do that i stands for pursuing the improvement in the enterprise risk management if there is any need if there is any change we'll do it sir r stands for reviewing the risk and performance do not forget this sir sir do not forget this sir that is the gopro we have done the r moving on moving on to the o ongoing information communication reporting we are not forget let's write ongoing do not forget that ongoing ongoing do not forget that we have a tip over here t stands for leveraging information and technology t stands for leveraging information and technology how can we forget technology sir we are not going to be missing that i stands for communicating risk and information got it sir p stands for report on risk culture and performance risk culture and performance that is what tip is all about we have done the five components we have done the 20 principles over here is that clear yes sir was that tough no sir the more and more you will practice the more and more you will have this mnemonics learned and of course repeat like the way i am doing it will be in your blood and i am sure you will rock it in the exam is that clear yes sir can we go ahead yes sir moving on my friend let's go on to the next topic that is Serbans Oxley Act 2022. I can tell you, Serbans Oxley came up after the the kind of frauds that we saw. Say, let's say in WorldCom or in Enron, and we'll talk Enron. You know, as we go forward, we'll talk on that too. I just want to give you that just also in terms of you know what really happened in Enron. 
but all of this really resulted into you know us regulators really getting up and having a law framed up for dealing with these kind of things what was being observed uh, in the in the uh, in these fraud was that the management the leaders the cfos the ceos they really took the advantage they did something wrong of course they got penalized later but they did something wrong with the belief that they can get away with it with the belief that they can really play around with the, the, the with the controls play around with the accounting norms and play around with the pronouncements that are there so they really wanted to come up and curb the malpractices that were happening over there so they really came up with a law and you know which is well known as serbens oxley which really came up at that point in time primarily to protect the right of the investor the people at large who really suffered at that point in time whether it is the equity shareholder or whether it is the creditor whether it is the regulator or whether it is you know the pension fund holders you know and the employees who who lost you know their jobs their pension benefits and so on and so forth you know all of that really you know went up to a stage where a regulator has really had to come up and they had to come up with a law which is serbens oxley act so and you, when you'll read the law it's a beer law there is less of an explanation over here and you'll see in terms of you know how strict the law is how strict they have become now to ensure that you know people who have been doing what they're doing they should not be able to do that so you'll you know you'll understand that as we go into it that you know how stricter uh you know the regulator are now as compared to what they were before to ensure that you know you cannot do that mistake again the cfo ceo beware serbens oxley is there they seeing you they are protecting the rights of the investor you cannot do anything wrong shall we go and check that out yes sir all right moving on my friend serbens oxley act 2022 okay let's go and check that out some of the key provisions that are there are mentioned and let's go and check that out title 3 and title 4 and title 8 9 and 11 there are various titles to it you know some of the some of the very relevant titles that should be that you should be knowing and of course that that are tested in the exam are this which should be really aware of title 3 it relates to the financial reporting requirements of an issuer and specific representation required by the top official of the public companies they really want to ensure that you're giving a specific representation onto it all right title 4 enhanced disclosures that are needed title 8 9 and 11 penalties for violating the act not applicable to the investment companies very important that you know the title 8 9 and 11 you would always see a question on that should we go and check that out yes sir title 3 corporate responsibility let's go and check this out relates to the establishment of audit committee and representation made by the corporate officer that is ceo and cfo they really have to make a representation and that is what we'll be learning over here public companies are responsible for establishing the audit committee you really need to know this do not forget that that is responsible for appointment compensation and oversight of public accounting firm employed by the company all righty now what auditor to report directly to the audit committee think of my friend think of a situation where an auditors were reporting to the management only now a auditor will report on to somebody like a bernard ebor or scott sullivan sullivan what will they do they'll try to play around with it right now all of these frauds you know really you know shook the entire corporate governance of an organization you know what we saw as you know coso really coming up and giving you a risk management framework the you know the the overall enterprise risk management framework that we learned of course we learned various components various principles onto it everything will go for a toss if there is a collusion that is happening in between the auditor and the management of the firm serbens oxley came up over there you know what now auditor would report to audit committee an audit committee would have independent directors let's go and check that all right audit committee is responsible for resolving dispute between the management and auditor if there is a dispute that really comes up between the bernard ebers and the audit committee then who would resolve or, sorry and the auditor then who would resolve audit committee would resolve that the audit committee establishes procedures to accept reports of complaints regarding the audit or the internal control issues important my friend that we know that if there are any issues that really come their way there have there is a procedure now that you can reach out to the audit committee you just can't live that on your own not happening now a audit committee members aren't 
to be board of directors but should be independent may not accept any compensation or may not be an affiliated person their compensation is not dependent on how comp you know how a company is doing they are the independent ones the independent directors and that is what really comprises of audit committee because they do not want any kind of conflict of interest happening over there very important that we should know what servants oxley is very important that we should know how servants oxley really protect you know the reason i gave the example of worldcom i really wanted you to have that picture in your mind when you're thinking about corporate governance when you're thinking about risk management when you're thinking about the the, the enterprise risk management framework when you're thinking about these components these principles when you're thinking about servants oxley all of these things should come onto your mind and then we'll play around with that and then it will be a lot easier for you to really have these these components or these concepts being consumed by you is that clear yes sir moving on to the responsibility for the financial reports let's go let's go and check that out this really really pushes up you know all of the cfos and the ceo to show to make sure that they're not doing anything wrong let's go and read that all right the ceos and the cfos representation what is that the ceo cfo financial representative must sign what representation to assess the report annually or quarterly that they have reviewed it that this is being fairly presented it doesn't contain any untrue statement or omit any material information they have to assume the responsibility for the internal control they have disclosed all significant deficiencies in the design and operation of uh, and the operation of control any fraud whether material or not and you uh, have to disclose sorry any fraud that is material or not and report if there is any significant change in the internal control this is what the law has done law really wanted the cfo and the ceo to take the responsibility of saying you know what we have reviewed everything you can't just say and run away the like the way they did and i can tell you, you know in 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 enrons of the world or the world comes of the world you know these leaderships these leaders they really say you know what i didn't know it i have not seen it i have not seen it you know it, it never came to my notice you know you know go for it, you know go and take a walk that's not happening that's just not happening servants oxley is there servants oxley is there to tell you you know what you are responsible for it you would review it you have to sign it and that is why you are responsible for it isn't that really great yes sir no officer or director or any person under their direction may take any action that would fraudulently influence coerce mislead or manipulate the auditor to make the financial state reporting statement misleading very very right step to be taken in that direction moving on in case of any misstatement due to material non compliance with the financial reporting ceo and cfo should reimburse for any bonuses incentive based on equity based compensation gains on the sale of securities during 12 months period excellent i love this they really have to pay back anything that they've learned or anything that they've earned which they should not have earned at the cost of people's mercy or at the cost of people you know the long thing that they've done to people they should have to you know just just reimburse everything back or give everything back to the corporate what they've earned which they should not be earning isn't that really great yes sir should we move on yes sir title 4 enhanced financial disclosure let's go and check this out too all right disclosure in the periodic report in quarterly and annually reports okay all material correcting adjustment should be there or material off balance sheet transaction off balance sheet transaction means you know any loan that you have taken which is you know which is uh, low, say you know any any uh, Uh, news that has come up because of which you have to you know write off something but since you know it came later off you know later you know post you closing you know the, your books of accounts will you be adjusting that you may not need to right because that's an off balance sheet item any kind of contingent liability can you know is an off balance sheet item you have to really mention it over here you can't just get away with that servants ox are looking at to you all right conformance of the performance financial statement use use of special purpose entities you know spvs were used the special purpose vehicles or entities were used in enron to you know have a fraud over there and we'll talk on that but what is imperative is that law now understand that and that is the reason they specifically said now you have to you know really explain what is the use of special purpose entities or vehicles to ensure that you're not missing on to that all right moving on my friend to the number one loan to the directors are allowed only if gave in ordinary course of business given on the same terms as given to the public moving on to the next one related party transaction to be disclosed let's go and do that too statement is to be filed for the transaction with the persons who have directly or indirectly more than 10% ownership you really have to have to mention all of that and then what along with the annual report 
issues has to include what statement that management is responsible for establishing and maintaining internal control structure and procedure for financial reporting they have to take the responsibility and assessment of the effectiveness of the internal control structures so and procedures they have to take the holistic responsibility you cannot just run away from that all right moving on to the title 7 which is sorry title 8 which is what corporate and criminal fraud accountability again very important thing you really need to know you know how accountable they are and what kind of penalties are there now all right the criminal penalty for altering the documents if they are altering anything there is a criminal penalty to it when an individual alters or destroys or falsifies any record with an intent to obstruct or influence investigation, he will be fined or imprisoned maximum of 20 years or both. Imagine my friend, 20 years or both, okay. Auditors should retain record work papers for 7 years, 7 years, 7 years, 7 years, do not forget that. Yes, if not, will be fined or imprisoned maximum 10 years or both, maximum 10 years or both. You can have an imprisonment for an auditor also for 10 years or both. Do not forget that. Security fraud. Individual may be fined, imprisoned, maximum 25 years or both and can be challenged no later than earlier of two years after the discovery of fact or five years after the, you know, uh, uh, I would say violation. How you can challenge that is also something that is being defined over here. Do not, do not really forget that. All right. Whistleblower protection. There is a protection to the one who is really, really, you know, pulling off the lever. You really have to escalate if you have to, to the person, you know, who is providing the evidence of fraud. What is the benefit that is being available? May not be harassed in any way. Law specifically says that he, he should, you cannot harass anyone who is raising on something like that. May file a complaint with the Secretary of Labor. May be provided with compensatory damages, including reinstatement of same seniority status. You can just get, get away with it. If there is somebody who is in organization at whatever level, if he's escalating something, he's bringing things to notice, you cannot just get away with it. You cannot just, you know, let that person go away. He would be available. He would be there on that seniority position any which ways. All right. Back pay and interest if there is a need. Compensation for any special damage as a result of discrimination, including the litigation cost. Do not, do not forget that, that you may get exposed to this if you're doing something like this all right moving on to my friend the title nine again you know these all are the penal provisions that are there to the cfo to the ceo to the leadership of organization and you really need to know this you know i have headed an organization being a cfo i know the kind of things that are really falling onto your head at that point in time i have to you you really have to be 100 percent sure of not doing these things and that is the reason my friend it is very important for you to be the future leaders of an organization to know that what you can do and what you should not do is that clear yes sir moving on moving on to title 9 white collar crime penalty enhancement okay let's go and read that attempt and conspiracy includes mail fraud or wire fraud that means any fraudulent scheme to intensely deprive another of property or honest services via mail or wire connection the penalty would be 20 years do not forget that violation of any employee retirement income security erisa there is or there was an issue in the frauds also that we have seen by now that employee retirement really went for a toss penalty not more than a hundred thousand dollars okay and not more than 10 years okay for an individual and not more than five hundred thousand dollars for non-individuals the companies they can really get exposed to this penalty is determined reviewed and amended by sentencing commission <clears throat> You really need to know this that you know the all are the penalties that are being exposed to or getting reviewed by the sentencing commission sentencing commission also reviews additional aggravating or mitigating circumstances for a particular offense that should justify an exception to the excess existing sentences you have to understand that you know who you can really go to for a review and that is what the sentencing commission is all about is that clear yes sir moving on to the failure of the corporate officer to certify the financial report now let's say i am the cfo and i do not want to certify for whatsoever reason then what failure of the corporate officer to certify the financial report if that is the case then what would you do let's go and check that any periodic report and a statement financial sorry statement filed with sec must be accompanied by what let's go and check this out very important a written statement that periodic report fully complies with the sec act 1934 now think of my friend that how strict they are now 
in terms of asking all of these declaration and these statements so that you're not really missing on to that a written statement that the information is fairly presented in all material respect signed by ceo and cfo see what they're really doing the rs vcfos are really on the block our neck is on the block if any of the above is not complied with then fine and imprisonment can be imposed a party who certifies any wrong statements knowingly can be fined maximum of what a million dollar or imprisonment of maximum 10 years okay a party who willfully certified any non-compliance and can be fined maximum of five million dollars or imprisonment of 20 years it's huge my friend if you do anything wrong you would be behind the bars all throughout your life do not do not forget that very important for you to know that all of these things can really put you behind the bars and one should never 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 forget that is that clear yes sir should we go and move forward yes sir title 9 corporate fraud accountability sorry title 11 my friend corporate fraud fraud accountability let's go and check that tempering record impeding an official proceeding will lead to a fine or, or prison for a maximum of 20 years temporary freeze authority for sec to escrow the payment in any interest bearing account for 45 days they may take your escrow account you know no, sorry to 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 you may make put a freeze on to your account for 45 days authority of sec to prohibit person from serving the officers or directors if you have done something wrong they may prohibit you if that individual has violated rules and regulation and sec determines that the individual is unfit to continue to serve as an officer director then they will certainly do that retaliation against the information sorry informants if a person knowingly takes any harmful action against the person who gave the information to SEC, then he can be fined or imprisoned up to 10 years. Again, whistleblower has a protection, my friend. Do not just take them for granted or do not just get away with them. You know, they are the ones who are really protected by the law and you have to take care of that come what may. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Should we go and check the other things? Yes, sir. Moving on guys, you know, let's start practicing few questions now. It's good that we should have a hang off in terms of, you know, how the questions are being asked in the exam. It's more to get some color, get some context as to how the questions are being tested out in the exam. Let's go and start off with the first one. Alrighty, we have a question that talks on a company that maintains a strong internal audit function, strong internal audit function, got it? That reports directly to the board of directors. Excellent, sir. So this is the best thing to happen, sir. The internal audit function should report to board of directors, sir. That really helps us in the in, in having the having the right checks and balances being in place. Got it, sir. In applying the ideas from which of the principles of effective control. Oh, sorry, effective internal control over financial reporting. We know that, sir, this is something we have done, sir. What were the five components of the internal control? We know, sir, there were five components of internal control called crime, sir. Yes, sir. What was the first one? Sir, C for control, control environment, sir. Yes, this is part of that, sir. We know that, sir. Would that be human resources? No, sir. It cannot be part of human resources. How can that be, sir? Because human resources deals with in terms of, you know, having the policies and principles in place in relation to the hiring, retiring, working, and so on and so forth. It is not to deal with these kind of things. Got it, sir. Authority and responsibility. Does it really relate to it? No, sir. It doesn't relate to authority and responsibility primarily because this is more to do with the structure of the organization, sir. The authority and responsibility is, is more, more, I would say, minute or micro in the nature in terms of, you know, what really it deals with. But over here, it is the theme that one would, have, one would need to have from the standpoint of having an internal audit function being reporting on to the board of directors. It is more to do with the having the right organizational structure in place, sir. And that's what the option C is all about. When you read the solution, you'll get to know the answers in terms of you know why it is right the way it is right and of course coming on to the board of directors no it cannot be the board of directors as a principle because board of directors as a principle really deals with in terms of you know i would say on the one side it is more to do with you know what really uh, a director has to do what really a director has to manage how the effectiveness of the organization will be managed how the effectiveness would be controlled what kind of foundations they need to lay down and so on and so forth it cannot be the board of directors sir. it has to be the organizational structure if you really read through this the organization structure principle says that the reporting relationship should not 
undermine the commitment of the effective financial reporting and internal control that's the theme of the organization structure because the way you are structuring your organization itself calls for the kind of controls you are in building in the organization at large very important we should not miss on that many of the times my friend many of the times for example in this in this case authority and responsibility is one of the area where you would have got confused that that is the right answer but that's not the case you have to see the more right answers and you know this is you know you would see me saying this again and again like a broken record that in cpa there are various times various occasions that you would find in the exam wherein you would find that there are more than one right answers in the in the exam but you have to choose down what is the more right answer what is the more right option that you have over there that is the play that is the game that you really need to play over there and that's what we will prepare you for is that right yes sir now if i read out the authority and responsibility the authority and responsibility principle says that authority and responsibility should be delegated to the individual within the organizational structure as appropriate to maintain the effective control it's the it's I, as i said it's a more micro thing that one would have once you have the organizational stru organizational structure then it is more micro to have that you know who would do what how would that be controlled and so on and so forth that is the reason choice b is not the right answer i would also read the choice d which is the board of directors the board of director principle says that board should be clearly actively involved in overseeing the implementation of both financial reporting and internal control they are really looking forward to it it is not that you know board of director principle really decides in terms of you know who would be you know it's it's more like how the how the internal audit function will work or who does that report to is not something that the board of director principal would decide it's again the step forward to it wherein they would decide in terms of you know how, what kind of policies procedure needs to be there in terms of ensuring the effective reporting that has to happen many of the times my friend you would see a situation wherein you would see a gray wherein two or three or at times four all of four of that can be a right answer you have to choose what is the more right one over there it may seem difficult to start with but the more you would practice practice with me without me the more you would excel on that and of course hit that in the best possible way is that clear yes sir coming on to the next one i think it's an easy one the company has established and communicated baseline expectation for performance to all employees oh 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 i'll read that again company has established and communicated baseline expectation for performance to all employees very good the company's action demonstrated focus on which of the following components which of the following components of the internal control is being hit out here crime we know that sir c stands for control environment sir r stands for you know it's it's more to do with and it's more to do with uh, you knowing that you know what will go where as in in this case company establish the you know and 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 have a communication baseline expectation for the performance of all of the employees so it's like the it's like company is overlaying you know how the expectation of an organization would be as far as the employees are concerned now you have to choose out you know which which area this really falls into would that be a control environment we'll talk on in a while will that be an information communication sir it can be right because he confused you that they have established a communication you know it's communicated sorry company has established and communicated baseline expectation so one would see that you know oh, it's it's related to communication so somewhere it will be part of information communication no it will not be part of information communication because holistically what the organization is doing over here is that they are laying the overall control environment of an organization it is not that they are communicating internally in terms of you know how the things are happening or externally in terms of you know how the things should happen and are happening very important to differentiate things like this while on the face of the question itself you would feel that it is part of information and communication but when you will go through the principles when you will go through the components you would realize that you know okay and for that you may have to you know somewhere have a good hang of those uh principles and those components you have to really have the go you know good hand of that but once you have it then all that you need to know is that you know which will go where how it will go where how it will fit in over there and so on and so forth and more importantly you need to understand why the wrong answer is not the right answer for example in this case information and communication cannot be the right answer cannot be the right answer because it is it is more micro in nature it is more internal communication it is more external communication over here you are really having the expectation setting being done 
for all of the employees of an organization it is more like a tone at the top it is more like you know you're really really having the overall organizational feel or feeder being created to ensure that you know everything that is happening is right can that be a control activities again control activities part of the control environment but it can or cannot include what is being said as baseline expectation but for control environment it is certainly a thing that to happen you have to, in order to have the right control environment you really need to have these kind of expectation being set out of there can that be monitoring activity no sir it is nowhere related to the monitoring while since you are setting the expectation you may think that you know it is somewhat related to monitoring and that's the beauty of the cp exam all of the answer choices would be somewhat somewhere related to the right answer but they would not be the right answer and you have to choose out the right one and get it going over here the right answer would be the control environment because in control environment one of the most important thing is that you are really really coming across with how the organization should be working on if i read out the solution the control environment component of the internal control framework represent the processes structure and standards that provide the foundation of the establishment of the entity's internal control system that's what it is the baseline expectation of the employee performance are included in the accountability principle remember eboka yes sir it is part of eboka and that's what you should not be forgetting is that clear it will come your way my friend you may not be able to like grasp it in one go but the more and more you'll practice on that the more and more you will get to understand as to why the right answer is the right answer and why the wrong answer is not the right one is that clear yes sir moving on to another one a successful and profitable launch of new product line by the entity represent what is it a value creation erosion preservation or realization we know that sir sir we are launching launching a successful product line that is nothing but the value creation sir i think you don't even have to think twice that it is not an erosion it is not a preservation it is not a realization it is nothing but it is nothing but creation we know that that's an easy one you would get to see some easy ones also in the exam which will give you marks like this but then there will be certainly certainly some mcqs in the exam wherein you would get confused and that is where your rule of elimination or your use you know use of right selection would really help you choosing out the right one for you is that clear yes sir moving on to the next one let's go and read this out which of the following is not the goal of erm framework which of the following remember he saying not which of the following is not the goal i really want to highlight this this is classic my friend many of the cpa students really struggle with this because these are the some these are some terms that they, they try to miss on which is like which they may write an answer saying which of the following is a goal of erm they have forgotten that question is asking that which of the following is not the goal of erm so if it is not the goal of erm so you would have to read all four and then say this is the one which is not thing which i don't think erm should be responsible for or here erm should be working for and that's where you reading the question rightfully is the super important thing you really have to be ensuring that you know these nots these not to bees these subject tos are not being missed and you're really taking the good control of it sir we are fintrammer sir we are not going to be missing on it i love you my friend for that the more you will do this the more you will practice this the more you will understand this you will rock in the exam is that clear yes sir now which of the following is not the goal number 1 avoid the adverse publicity oh, oh oh i'm sorry avoid the adverse publicity and damage to the to the entity's reputation is that is that a expectation of an erm i don't think so no sir this is not okay achieve financial and performance target yes sir erm has to has to deliver this sir they are responsible to achieve what is required sir all right provide reasonable expectation that the company's objective and goals are achieved and problems and surprises are minimized it goes without saying sir that's the goal of erm sir we we clearly clearly clear on that assesses risk continuously and identify the steps to take the resources to allocate the and allocate and overcome or mitigate the risk absolutely sir that's the role of erm what is not really going on to your mind which is the right one this that is having an answer choice this this is certainly not the goal of erm and we know that we understand that we've read through the question we understood it that is going to be it is that clear 
Yes, sir. Moving on to another one, my friend. Let's go. I know it's a stretch run, my friend, but we have to do it. We have to become the qualified CPA. How can we not do it? Let's go and do this. According to the Servants Act of 2002, okay, we, when an issuer board of directors selects the member to be on the company's audit committee, when the issuer's board of director select the member to the company's audit committee, the board of directors must select individuals who are what? Who are what? Number one. Are affiliated person of the company subsidiary sir you should just just make a cross on to it they are not supposed to be related sir sir we have known sir Benz Oxley sir now we have read through that sir we are Fintrammer sir nobody can fool us sir I am loving you my friend for that all right are employed by the company in the financial management role no sir it cannot happen are the management are the member of the company's board of directors yes sir one thing i'll add on to it uh, they should be independent board of directors sir. i'm loving you my friend they should be the independent directors of the board those are the ones who will be selected to become the part of the audit committee i'm really really loving you for that this is gonna be the right answer but let's read the last one who knows that if it can be more right. All right, let's go and check that out. Receive consulting fees, but not advisory fees from the company. No, sir, that's not, that's that's absolutely not done. Answer is C. I'm loving you, friend, for, mother, you know, for that. You have to think yourself, read this way. You have to highlight the important words, the stress words like subject to, not included, except for or what we you know what we saw over here when we were reading this when he say he's no, it is not the goal all of these are the stress words we have to know we have to understand and ensure that we are not pissing on to it the more we'll do that the best we are from the standpoint of answering that and get the best results out is that clear yes sir moving on to business processes that is another thing that we need to cover i know this is a stretch run my friend but we have to do it we have to do it to excel in the entire entire bc curriculum important piece over here is my friend that if you're really having any doubt any queries anything that in your mind that really comes into your mind just keep noting that we will be discussing we will be getting into the details towards the end of the session all right moving on to business processes now business processes is something that all of us somewhere somewhat aware of we are all of we have you know anybody who is part of any organization we all know this right we have been dealing with various business processes and it is not a news for us and you would when you go through the content that you know that would also make you feel that you know all of these things are you know something that we are already aware of we already know but what we really need to understand is that there are some peculiar peculiar areas which examiner really picks up on this and really ask us and we'll be discussing that as we go forward all right business processes now what is that activities performed by an organization to achieve the specific goal is the business processes are very generic sir sir this is very 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 common yes we know that business process management all of us have to do that all of us manages our own processes and that's what we really need to learn in terms of how to best manage the processes how to really evaluate that and of course really help in terms of covering the gaps and the issues that we may observe as we get into any company all right now business process management what does that mean to coordinate all the functions of the organization for continuous improvement in the achievement of organizational objectives we know this sir we understand that sir that's not something that we are not aware of all right for efficiency and effectiveness in the operations through promotion of innovation flexibility integration and technology this is the fever of the season innovation and technology you get into any company my friend this is the theme, this is the fever that all of us have, all of us have to deal with on day in and day out basis. The BPM, the business process management on improving processes, focuses on improving processes continuously. That is the aim, that is the mantra all of us have to follow. We have to ensure that we are not missing on to it, come what may. All right, moving on my friends, software and the tools for the business process improvement now if you really go through this you would understand that you know all of these things are very generic and all of us are doing this in day in and day out as are we really working in our companies working in our profiles and so on and so forth the business process management the goal of bpm is to identify document model assess improve optimize and potentially automate the outsource business processes all right or outsource business processes the business process analysis what does that mean to determine the processes to add value to the organization 
business process analysis is a methodology that looks at an organizational processes to improve the effectiveness and the efficiencies that's what you generally do you really think of you know that you really need to do an improvement in any kind of processes that you're dealing with let let's say you are doing dealing with the receivable process or the payable process or the payroll process or the revenue process or the expense process and so on and so forth you're really working in in all of these corporations in different different roles let's say i'm managing the entire payroll of an organization or i'm managing the revenue of an organization or expense of an organization or i'm managing the overall overall let's say compliances of an organization there is a process that really you know an organization really follows right from the start to the end in terms of you know managing the entire show or the entire life cycle of let's say billing i'm just taking an example from the revenue standpoint you know it starts from you know you receiving in terms of you know what you really need then you really go and you know you apply for the you know bid for it then you know the order really comes up then you really fulfill the detail then you ask for the payment you raise the bill then you get the payment there is a process right when there is a process which is like end to end process that you really need to follow what is imperative and important is that we understand that we have to follow that process come what may and if we have to follow that process come what may we have to think about that you know what all are the areas that are needing an improvement or that needing that are needing a change and that's what the entire business process management or business process improvement is all about wherein we see through the process we understand that to us as to what that is and then think of you know as to what areas needs an improvement what areas we really need to work hard or work differently and so on and so forth and that's what we'll be doing that's what we are targeting over here we have you know understood what the business process management overall is we know that business process analysis is basically understanding what the status quo kind of a thing in terms of you know what is there currently on the plate and then thinking about you know what can we automate business process automation what does that mean business process automation looks to identify and automate or you know the business processes the approach works to convert processes that are manual repetitive recurring into systematic automation process using automated technology who doesn't know this we all are really exposed to all of these automations on day in and day out basis in any company that you're really working with or you may work with you have to deal with this end to end all right business process modeling tools there are some modeling tools also that we really need to know for the graphical presentation of the business processes with the help of data flow diagrams flow charts and system interface diagrams we really deal with these kind of things in terms of you know really knowing the processes end to end because that also helps you understand and have the complete and overall view of how the overall processes of the organization really looks like is that clear yes sir should we go and check out further yes sir moving on impact of the business processes you know all of these business processes somewhere does have an impact on the overall performance of the business and that's what we'll be learning over here very generic again as i said this is not a rocket science we all understand that the only thing is that we really need to know some peculiar nuances that are really coming in a while all right impact on the business processes what all are the impacts with the help of software tools you know accounting and reporting system business processes will have following improvements or following you know areas wherein you would see an impact on the organization at large enhanced efficiencies in collecting storing processing and analyzing information really helps right very generic right we know we know that any process if it will come up it really help us in terms of knowing all of these things having all of these things in the organization and in turn will help organization to do well all right moving on improved accuracy in the reporting who doesn't know this if you have an automated process if you have a process that is very much strengthened from end to end standpoint you would certainly have better accuracy we all we we all need to have it we all know it and we all really strive to get that optimization of the supply chain for production and purchasing of the inventory you have the real time placement of the orders happening you have the just in time order what is that that is nothing but you having a perspective or a system being available that really helps you to understand what is needed to ensure that production is never stopped never hampered and so on and so forth this really has an impact on the on the organization at large is that clear yes sir greater customer service and attention of course if you have better processes better delivery better operating model better satisfaction then why customer would not be happy with it absolutely he will be really really relishing that you know automation of the activities will certainly you know will certainly be there better decision making certainly certainly will be there if you would have better system why would you not have a better decision making then increase insight through the analytics the more you would have right systems in place the more you have right output available to you the better insights that you would have that you can use for various analytics things that you really have to deal with day in and day out is that clear yes sir 
moving on some key business processes i really want to now get on to a level where and we'll touch upon some of the key business processes and think about as to what really happens over there all right and understanding and evaluation of these broad level business processes often refer to the cycle you know payable cycle receivable cycle and so on and so forth should be performed to identify key steps that occur within the processes what risk exist what mitigate controls and of course what should be implemented and what steps can be taken to improve the processes we'll soon get into some of the small processes per se from the organizational standpoint and see through as to what is really happening over there what all are the processes that we really have to follow it's more having in a general understanding all of all of those processes that you may get exposed to when you really step into any organization is that clear yes sir moving on let's go and check out on the revenue process now revenue process we all know that sir let's go and read this out the process involves what managing customer accounts and relationship and exchanging information through invoices and payment that's the basic revenue process you need to know as to what your who your customer is then of course you need to know what the need is and then rest is the history it impacts the other key business processes in the following ways you have you ever thought that the revenue process may impact the other processes let's go and check that all right it impacts the human resource and pay you know and payroll process sales may impact the pay of sales staff and demand may require hiring more staff that's how it, this really impacts the human resource and payroll processes the manufacturing and the expenditure process again if you would have more expenses in relation to the revenue that you really need to generate that would have an impact on the expenditure whether organization is selling manufactured goods or it is doing trading only you know depends upon you know which kind of operating model you are really working on with that would have an impact on the manufacturing and the expenditure process got it sir financing and reporting processes this would also get impacted by the revenue impact reporting requirement and the creation of the financial statement the revenue recognition is one of the critical tasks that would be given to you my friend when you would step into any organization as a qualified cpa do not forget that revenue recognition as per us gap is going to be the most important thing and we will really get into the details of it when we'll touch upon the far on this on this you know from this perspective you really need to know as to what really needs to be recognized how is to be recognized when it is to be recognized and so on and so forth one of the very very prominent area which examiner also tests you and of course this is something that you would always get an exposure with when you will get in and, and step into any organization is that clear yes sir all right moving on my friend revenue processes activities have four steps four steps all right number one you have a sales order my friend you know and say or sales order receipt and the entry that is the first step that you really start off with then what you do is you do the delivery of the service of the goods you get the order you do the delivery you get the order you do the delivery you get the order you do the delivery got it sir then you do the billing my friend you have done the delivery now comes the billing now comes the billing now we know this sir sir we understand this sir there is not a rocket science sir absolutely not my friend that's why that's how i really really started off with this is not difficult it's gonna be super easy for you the only thing is that we really have to understand these these normal normal phenomenons and of course see through as to how examiner would be testing us on this in the exam we'll check on that too all right then comes the collection my friend and of course and then comes the recording also recording and financial reporting that really happens after that we know that sir that's the very very basic thing isn't that something we know yes sir is that something clear yes sir moving on to the expending processes the expenditure processes again on the same lines let's try to cover it that all right the expenditure process is the customer side of the revenue process all right it's the vice versa of revenue process this involves placing orders receiving and paying for the goods and services and maintaining supplier records the process typically affect the other key business processes in the following ways all right <clears throat> the revenue process the organization is selling procured goods of course it really impacts there the human resource and payroll process impacts the pay of purchasing and receiving staff and may require hiring more staff got it sir very generic sir no problem manufacturing processes you know product to sell has to be manufactured or purchased depending upon what you are really doing it will really impact in terms of you know what your overall manufacturing process is all about got it sir then financing and reporting processes impact reporting requirement and the creation of financial statements very generic my friend but we really need to know in terms of you know what that is to ensure that we are not missing on to it got it sir no issue sir it's very generic sir all right expenditure process activities have four steps okay 
placing an order of goods and services okay you would be placing an order over here because you are really doing an expense so you would be placing an order for the goods or services to be really taken and consumed all right then what goods are delivered and our services are rendered then you know either the goods would be delivered to you or the services would be rendering rendered to you and then you would take on from there receipt and approval of billing by the you know by performing three way match you know that is purchase order receiving report and the vendor invoice very important thing my friend that you really need to circle down over here is that when you get an invoice and you really go for the approval of it you have to see through that you know has that gone through the three tier approval kind of a thing wherein it has to have you know a purchase order it has to have a receiving report and then it has to have the invoice that really demonstrate what you have received so that's the three way check and you have to have the segregation of duties we'll touch upon that in a while in terms of controls that we really need to have but what is really imperative over here is that we are having that in our mind in terms of you know how the overall process really works all right then comes the bill payment my friend once you have done all of that then the rest is the history you would pay you will record and you'll move on is that not something we are aware yes sir should we go and check the other one yes sir all righty human resource and payroll process so this is again something my friend that you would have already seen already seen and of course tested in your organization it's just that we have to see in terms of you know how the process is really spans out all right human resource process activities cover and employees you know employees entire time uh, you know in the organization and we all know that it's, it's the employee life cycle all right then what it really covers the activities covers what hiring employees onboarding and training employees establishing compensation plan assigning employees to the department and functions monitoring review and evaluating employee performance responding to the employee concerns establishing and enforcing termination procedures isn't that something very basic that we have seen yes sir payroll process activities are again something that we really have to deal with in these kind of scenarios got it sir establishing compensation plan assigning and updating compensation activity report third party withholdings and rates payroll disbursements and of course the accounting and reporting of it very generic thing that you see in any payroll and hr processes moving on to the manufacturing process you know these processes my friend are very generic we don't have to spend too much amount of time on to this you just have to give a overview or a glance over all of these kind of things and of course take that as it really comes up we have to deal with some of the control checks that we really needed to have and we'll really spend good amount of time on that in terms of understanding more about that all right moving on my friend the manufacturing process the manufacturing process is directly linked to both revenue and expenditure we know that sir and then manufacturing process requires the purchase of goods to be transformed and sold it impacts the other key processes in the following ways it impacts what revenue process the expenditure process hr process and of course financing and reporting process how revenue process revenue process will be generated by selling the goods that are manufactured by the entity everything has an interrelationship we all understand that sir the expenditure process to procure goods to be transformed and supplied okay okay we got that to be used in the manufacturing process demand of input in the manufacturing derived from the demand of final products that's the very basic we understand that coming on to the human resource and the payroll process that impacts what labor cost and hiring we know that so that's the basic basic thing all right does that impact the financing and reporting processes yes sir it impacts because somewhat my financial statement creation is dependent on that that's how it will be really impacting that got it sir then manufacturing process activities the manufacturing process involves the following five steps what are those the product design and engineering got it sir the product development got it sir the manufacturing forecasting and scheduling got it sir the manufacturing operations got that sir and then manufacturing and fixed asset accounting and reporting do not forget at times it is needed that we are not missing on these small small pointers got it sir i need this at times because it is difficult to read small small things at times got it sir and then let's move forward we have finance and reporting coming your way all righty we understand sir this is the basic process sir this is our bread and butter sir we have been dealing with this day in and day out sir financing and reporting includes what the treasury function the recording of transaction in the general ledger and ultimate creation of the financial statement we all understand that finance and reporting process activities there are three steps involved in that all right number 
Treasury function will manage the cash flow and finance activities of an organization. General ledger update is something that we do. And of course, financial statement and managerial report generation. Many of the times I get a query on this that, you know, sir, from the accounting standpoint, there are n number of activities that we do. All of that really gets into the general ledger updates, my friend. The entire accounting, the source document transaction, the, you know, the recording of transaction, the preparation of the, you know, trial balances, everything really gets onto the general ledger. And then comes the financial statement creation and we move forward. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Moving on, my friend, the business process control. We really need to have, we now we have learned the business processes. You know, we learned what the business processes are. We learned that, you know, there is a need of business process management. How does that impact? We, we have seen that. Then we really switched on our gears to kind of business processes we have. The revenue, the expenditure, the payroll and so on and so forth. We really dealt with that. Now comes, you know, do we really need a control on that? Yes. Why? To protect the organization, employees, customers and the other stakeholders it really helps on that and then what to ensure the efficiency and the effectiveness of the organization at large you really need to have that to ensure that you're not missing on to it the main is to prevent what the detection of any threat or the risk that anyone may have or may get exposed to and of course you know you really need to understand that you know you may be maybe an automated or may require human effort or judgment those are the kind of somewhat controls that you really need to really think about and of course have a built on into the system and that's what we'll be learning in a while all right moving on the management and the policy controls you have to now start off you know the kind of controls that they really have you know what kind of controls you can really have on all of these processes let's go one by one the management and the policy controls what is that these controls are the functions of the system that adjusts what operations as needed to achieve the plan or to maintain variation from the system objective within the allowable limit and focuses on number one how the processes are performed all right what safeguard should be adhered to and then how to address an escalate exception in the nutshell what management policy and control really helps you out with to understand on the overall basis in terms of you know what you should be doing what is happening and what really needed to be addressed and escalated very generic the, the i would say somewhat somewhere the tone of the top in terms of really telling you that this is what one should be doing this is what is not happening and this is what one should be really addressing in the best possible way is that clear yes sir should we move on yes sir now coming on to the another another control that we have that is segregation of duties very very common thing that you may see in the organization and this is one of the common topic that you would see being discussed at every level in the organization they really want segregation of duties to be there to ensure that there is a check and balance being available in terms of handling that in the handling the operations in the best possible way giving you a classical layman's example let's say you receive an invoice you are the one who is receiving the invoice you are the one who is approving the invoice and you are the one who is paying the invoice if this is the case then you becoming um, uh, you know a person uh, to to cheat or fraud uh, becomes hell lot easier for you because you have an opportunity there. You have an opportunity that you can approve anything. You have an opportunity that you can pay anything. If that is the case, the potential of you doing a fraud or something not right really goes up. And that is where the segregation of duties are being discussed in every organization that they want that somebody should be uh, doing X, somebody should be doing Y and somebody should be doing Z so that there is three level of controls over here and nobody is doing something which is not right. Let's say there is a person who receives the invoice which let, let's say the person to be Mr. Ram, the, he receives the invoice, the person who approves the invoice let's say is Mr. Sham, the person who pays the invoice let's say is Mr. Albert. Now, Ram, Sham and Albert, they would do their own check to ensure that, you know, everything is corrected at their level and they would not do anything hunky-dory or anything wrong, which, which can help, you know, help them get the best benefit because they would know that somebody else will catch it out. And that's what segregation of duties in the layman's language is all about and that's what we would be needed, needing to understand in anything that you would be really proposing or doing in the, in the corporate. All right. Now, very crucial to avoid fraud and error, as we, as we discussed, in the segregation of duties, following activities should be segregated from the another. All right, they call it ARC. Okay, uh, you know, ARC stands for the authorization, record keeping, and custody of the custody of the asset. Very similar to what we discussed. 
the custody of the asset include possession, receipt and creation of an asset at, at the organization. He is talking more of the asset side of it. I just spoke on the expense and then record keeping include data entry, recording transaction, preparing reconciliation, maintaining database and managing and modifying accounting records and reports such as general ledger and financial statement. So effectively the custody of the asset, the receipt of asset should be some, with, with somebody else and then recording of the asset in the books of account should be with somebody else and then comes the authorization which is approving and paying, approving or authorization business process activities transaction and decisions in general the following information system functions should be segregated important piece is that there is the need of segregation of duties and arc is to be followed authorization should be separate the record keeping should be separate and custody should be separate very basic my friend in general he said that you know following information system functions i'm more talking on is systems now should be segregated the system use and users the system coding and programming transaction and data entry data custody and storage authorization responsibility and monitoring response the example that i just gave you from the expense side of it if you really have that in your mind rest everything becomes history all that you need to ensure is that there needs to be segregation of duties anywhere anywhere you see or you feel that there can be a fraud happening because system has been defined or designed as such raise your voice change it out raise your voice change it out moving on my friend we have the input edit checks let's go and check that all right now what this input edit checks is all about these are nothing but the preventive controls preventive controls means they would really prevent something going wrong because it is a check on the edit or the input of the of the system it's more like garbage in garbage out right if you're really putting something wrong in the system you would get something wrong out of the system and that's what the input edit checks is all about we're not talking more on the system checks that you really need to have in the system to ensure that you're not missing on to it all right preventive control they assist what in protecting the integrity of the information and only allowing complete transaction to be submitted for processing input edit checks include what consistent forms when your forms to be submitted and there is a consistency in the form it really prevents that you know anything wrong going on into the system nothing will go wrong everything will be consistent information is consistent from one thing to the other and, and of course as as we go forward there would not be any surprises there would not be any changes then comes the completeness checks you have to you know when you get into any website and you fill in the details many times you would have seen that any detail you, have to, you would have not filled in he really goes back onto that and, and highlight it to be read. So it's a, like a completeness check, right? That you have not filled in this, please fill in this. It really helps you get the right information and ensure that completeness is there in anything that you receive. All right, then comes the reasonableness test. It's more like we, and it's more like judgmental also. You know, you really have to see that, you know, let's say, I'll give an example. Let's say, you know, we are uh, writing 100 words for, you know, let's say for, for uh, submission somewhere. You know, my, my, ch my check and balances would be there to tell me that, you know, the, the, the reasonableness is there in terms of, you know, the, the, the amount that I've written, the amount of words that I've written and so on and so forth. If you would have written something very less, he will highlight you that, you know, I think this is not being fulfilled. I think this has not been filled completely and so on and so forth. Then comes the field check. If there is any field that you have left blank, he'll highlight. Size check. You know, you, <laughs> it really happens at times, you know, that you, you are somewhat somewhere... Uh, you know submitting something but this the the size of the of the let's say attachment that that you have really uh, included or or uploaded is not something that system can really take so there's a check there that you know nothing will be accepted beyond beyond, beyond 5 mb so there's a size check in terms of you know what is to be uploaded it really helps you to control the right inputs that you really need to have so you define that these are the input things that i really needed to have and of course build your system accordingly so that you're not missing on to it then comes the limit or the range check you know many of the times you would see that you know you would get you let's say for mobile number you know you have a you know uh uh, a limit being given of 10 numbers that you know whenever there is a need of putting in mobile number the number has to be 10 it cannot be less or more because 10 digit is the mobile number of any company or any any person for that matter range check can also be there you can give a range let's say you know i you know i i know that you know uh, i let, let's say i need a i need you to put in your weight now if you're putting your in, in your weight i know that you know your weight can be let's say from from 1 kg to let's say you know 200 kg it cannot be more than that so there will be a range that you that you generally have and so on so forth Sci sign check you know of course you know you have a column of sign if you're not you know putting a sign onto it it will give you an error you have a you know referential integrity or the validity check it's more like you know 
a, doing a doing a sense check on the overall document in terms of you know that does it really relates to you know what we really needed or if there is any 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 kind of broad issue that we have seen considering the references to the to the uh, so called a standard document that that we have created then the closed loop verification at times you know you you really needed to have uh, the overall verification done for the for the organ, you know, for the you know, for this information that has been submitted at large and you do not want to miss on to that moving on to the processing controls we have done the done the data input controls it's more to check with what is really getting on to the system now we are thinking about you know what is being processed by the system we are talking on the processing controls to help what protecting an organization against process data from being incomplete or inaccurate following are some preventive process controls you have a data matching you know you may you match up the data of one what is being you know entered uh, to ensure that you know if there is anything that you can do to in, to see a gap or see a error or see a conflict you can really highlight that then comes the input validation it's more to do with you know what has really got into the system is right or not from the complete standpoint from the data integrity standpoint system processes that and and throws out an error onto it and then comes the sequence check you know as to you know what the sequence has been followed if you know from the data standpoint from the processing standpoint and if there is an error then also the error will be thrown out and then comes the cross footing it's more like totaling you know it's more like you know you would total out the somewhat the uh, uh, the let's say columns in the rows and see that you know yes the total that is being shown over there is right as per the, you know what the rows shows or what the column really shows is that right yes sir all righty moving on my friend to the standing data controls now standing data control is more to do with my friend the long term data that is there in the system you have to have to have some controls on your overall database or the long term data that you have into the system let's read standing data means master files or general data files that contain long term data that does not change often it's more like master data files all right standing data preventive controls include what access and authorization control you need to prevent my friend prevent in terms of accessing that data to ensure that no unauthorized access is being given got it sir read only rights many of the times you do not provide the right rights on that you cannot alter it you cannot cannot change anything onto it then change control you have to ensure that change control mechanism in place is in place to ensure that there are no no lapses that are being observed all right then regular backup of the files are to be maintained you know these are the master files you should have some regular backups being available to ensure that there is no no gaps being observed then and some detective standing controls would include the periodic reconciliation of changes to the data now this is very common right now let's say you have a file that is uh, I'm, i'm more talking from the standpoint of financial reporting let's say you have a file which is the latest trial balance of an organization now trial balance on the quarter close or the year end dates it keeps on changing now you have a you know uh, somewhat uh, periodic uh, reconciliation that is happening for the changes in the data points or changes in the revenue figures or in the expense figures that are happening so you regularly maintain that to ensure that you know, nothing really changes on to that review of employee access authorization and rights now this also goes to the payroll also you know the point number one the periodic reconciliation also goes to the payroll you have to review it on like yearly or six monthly or quarterly basis in terms of changes that are happening in the payroll data what is changing why it is changing and so on and so forth review of employee access authorization rights again you know relates to the fact that you are really checking on in terms of who is really having an access to these kind of files who is really changing anything and so on and so forth to ensure that you're not missing on to that all right now these are like standing data controls you know data which is more more stagnant or or standard in nature moving on to the spreadsheet controls again you know from the processing control standpoint there is a spreadsheet control also that really you really need really need to know you really have have spreadsheet controls on to the various files to ensure that you know nothing is being missed out all right preventive spreadsheet control are what access and authorization control you prevent you know who is to access who is authorized to look on to it there are some locked cells you do not want that to be changed you do not want that to be altered there are data validation that is happening on ongoing basis that is to protect that you know nothing really goes on to it then there is a change control mechanism again being being spoken out here then regular backup of that is also being ensured to ensure that your spreadsheet is always always having a backup detective spreadsheet controls periodic reconciliation to the changes and of course review of employee access authorization rights very similar to what we really know 
moving on to some of the supervisory and monitoring controls my friend again it is more like you know what is there once the data has been inputted what kind of support you can provide from the supervisory or the monitoring standpoint allow for review monitoring and oversight of business processes activities by the management you really have to do that then what do you really have to go one by one on that preventive supervisory and monitoring control include what having an organizational chart being prepared hiring guidelines supervision formal approval controls it's more like having the hygiene into the system to ensure that there are respective standard organizational chart being prepared you have what is to be set as guideline or the sop for really ensuring that you know this is the process the way it would look like like the hiring and of course you have to have the right level of supervision to ensure that all the control checks are in place and then you have the formal approval control mechanism in place to ensure that what is to be approved at what level at what authority is being dared from the designing as well as from the effectiveness in the implementation standpoint the, de the detective supervisory and monitoring control include what the process responsibility review again you know you have to review it on ongoing basis review of key performance indicators in terms of you know what are really going on you know the more you would have the review let's say you know i'm reviewing the revenue i'm reviewing the expenses i'm reviewing the payroll you know the more i'll i'll do that i'll understand that some kpis you know i would have let's say from the operating margin standpoint from the cogs standpoint the cost of goods sold standpoint from the standpoint of let's say the the uh, payroll cost to the revenue ratio and so on so for so different kpis that you can have you can measure that on ongoing basis as a detective control that you know everything that is being processed by the system is is absolutely fine budgets and the forecast is another way of doing it when you compare the actuals to the budgets to the forecast you get to know where the gap is what really 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 not working your way whether it is revenue whether it is cost if there is any gap that is being observed we can correct that out performance reviews again is something that you when, when you do the performance review both from the margin or the revenue or any other perspective for that matter you would get to understand that so what may go wrong what is going wrong where to correct and so on and so forth mandatory job rotation or the vocation now this is come something which is becoming very common these these days many of the key personal or key jobs of an organization are now being rotated you know there are different people who should be managing that and for that you know some people are being asked to go on the forced leave also just to make sure that you know everything that is that he's doing or she's doing is duly taken care of by somebody else so there are fresh set of eyes on to that to ensure that you know anything that is being missed or anything that is not being done rightfully can be corrected and can be really brought to the notice of the management all right then audits again we all know all of this audit is certainly a detective control in terms of you know understanding as to what is really going wrong and of course business resiliency control more like a bcp kind of a thing to understand that you know how resilient my business is from the standpoint of the risk that are, that may come our way coming on to the reconciliation and verification control you know again these are some you know you don't have to like mug this up but you have to really have that at the at the back of your mind being available onto yourself that these are the kind of controls i really need to be you know aware of in terms of you know what is really happening from the industry standpoint and you know what should i be doing when i would get to see a question on this coming on to the reconciliation control a detective control that reviews changes in the account balance due to business process activities or the difference in ledger accounts and value provided by the third parties such as bank if there is something like that it basically you're reconciling my friend it's more like a corroborative evidence that you really gather to and more from the outside outside sources to ensure that you know what you're doing what is being processed what is being thrown out is really corroborating with you know the 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 data points that are available outside the organization it reviews the difference between beginning and the ending balances follow up with any discovered errors and discrepancies it also involves segregation of duties between reconciliation preparation of the party and review sign off by the another party that's another way to look at it verification control preventive control is to verify the identity of the of the authorized users who are the authorized users you know what 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 kind of controls that you need to have from verification of those authorized user standpoint is something that you should be aware of as the verification control very generic my friend but as i said many of the times we tend to miss on on to these kind of things that is the reason these decks or these powerpoints that we have prepared for you can really help you in revising the entire content in a very quicker way and do do take the help of these you know when you're really going through the content and of course before the exam when you're revising the content in a quicker manner or in a shorter manner that will be very helpful for you to really have the complete hang of it is that clear yes sir moving on to the process documentation my friend now we have done you know in terms of you know what the overall 
process uh, uh, you know looks like we have done in terms of the controls that you need to have now comes you know what kind of documentation that you really need to prepare for to create the detailed documentation of the business process to make it ease for to analyze for identifying risk and the areas of improvement you have to do the process documentation and that is for what that is to gain an understanding for the process a person who is documenting the process must fully understand how the process is to be formed including an understanding of the key personal the impacted documents and the information the process origination and the ultimate process disposition or reporting now this is something that you should always look for this helps in what to gain an understanding of the process the document should conduct research on the process by reviewing policies and the procedures conduct interviews or provide questionnaire to involve personnel observe guided walk through the processes or even reform the processes it is more to understand what is there currently understanding the status quo and then thinking about as to what should be the as as you know what should be the future process so it's like it's like a walk from the as is to the future one and of course bridging the gap is that you know what kind of activities you need to take to ensure that it is definitely definitely uh, clubbing up or curbing up all the gaps that are being observed should we go ahead yes sir the types of process documentation let's go and check that out on this again this is something that you may get to see in the exam in some way or the other he generally throws a question at you that you know what kind of doc you know document you'll be using what kind of document you'll be preparing he may ask you the names so you should know what these documents are what kind of things that these documents have to be dealing with and then you'll be in a better shape to answer the examiner this is the relevant document to be used there and then should we go and check this out yes sir already the types of process documentation process narratives when you are writing the entire process it's more like you know having a theory on the entire process it is nothing but the process narratives written documents that tell the story of the process then you have the data flow diagrams data flow diagrams it really tells you the logical flow of data in the entire system the logical flow of data through the processes and focus on where the data comes from how it is transformed and it is final destination data flow diagrams include data sources data flow processes general and data destination the context diagrams are used to large processes that gives an understanding about point of data transformations and the risk due to data flow these context diagrams can be split in the sub processes important is that we should know that there are process narratives there are data flow diagrams data flow diagram really deals with you know the inflow of data the outflow of data in terms of you know what the life cycle of the data in the organization is then comes the flow chart flow chart is what the visual representation on how the document information flow through a process so it's more like a process documentation being depicted in the graphical or a visual format got it sir it utilizes a set of consistent symbols that represent various document and processes throughout the workflow it really helps you in terms of the controls that are there in the system or not depicted in a more more easier way which is nothing but the visual representation got it sir then comes the system interface diagram so what we have done till now we have done the process narrative we have done the data flow diagram we have done the flow chart coming on to the system interface diagram all right what this is demonstrate how the user and function both internal and external to an organization interface with an organizational system you may have an internet being used you may have intranet being used for your own website how you are you know really dealing with the outsiders how outsiders are dealing with you that kind of interface that are really there internally and externally both is being captured by the system interface diagram very common to an organization which is very very i would say technological centric from the standpoint of interfaces that they deal with uh, whether it is internal or external it shows how all the parties logically interact with one another and assist in the development and monitoring of the physical connection important pieces that we should know that these are the types of process documentation that we really need to really look for and we may have to do as we really step into any organization is that clear guys yes sir moving on moving on to the benefit of the process documentation let's go and check this out the benefit of the process documentation okay what is the benefit why will you do a documentation the goal of process documentation is to communicate how the data processing life cycle performs okay it provides written or the visual representation of data input processing storage and output for each 
business processes what more you need you really need somebody to tell you as to what is really happening happening on the side of on the side of data input processing storage and output for each business processes and this when comes from the you know in a visual way it really helps you to grab the information grasp it in a much better fashion because graphical graphical or you know the the visual um, uh, depiction of the process really enhances your ability to really capture all the details again to identify certain risk or threats to, to data processing cycle flow charts can identify risk in the you know in the following ways there are various ways my friend in which flow chart can really help you some of the ways that you really need to know is that flow chart can really help you in terms of understanding that this is the how the process really flows and this is how the gaps these are the gaps that are there both from the risk standpoint from the information standpoint from the standpoint of somebody not doing what they're really supposed to do and so on and so forth it is very important my friend that we should know that documentation is one of the tools that a management has to ensure that they are not missing out on various important areas is that clear yes sir all right there is a lot my friend that is there in this particular particular session i know we have covered a lot by now but what is really imperative and important is that we are not missing on these small small topics at times what we believe is that you know all of these topics are something we have already seen we know there is no rocket science in it sir it is it's going to be an easy one for you it may be but what is really imperative and important is that we are not losing out on these topics by leaving them while these are like really obvious ones they still need you to go through and of course understand in detail and you get to get to practice lot of that in in the questions that have been given to you practice that and then you would understand in terms of you know how cpa fertility has been testing you on is that clear yes sir should we really go and of course have a closure to the session now yes sir we have covered a lot my friend today and i just wanted to you know cover up in terms of you know things that we have covered in the bc1 in totality we have covered the internal control and internal control frameworks per se to start with we did con did concluded on that then we touched upon the enterprise risk management framework we touched upon to that we also touched upon the serbens oxley act in detail we we really lived that in terms of you know what that is we have touched upon the business processes in terms of you know what kind of processes are there the business process management and of course you know what is the impact and how one should be really having the control for that many of the times from the business process control standpoint you would get to see something some terminology being asked in the exam so it is all the more important that we really memorize all of those terminologies that are there from the systems perspective from the preventing controls you know perspective from the detective controls uh, detective control perspective we should know all of those terms so that we are not losing out on it is that clear yes sir now the two parts that are being left you know in this topic are the financial risk management which is something that we'll be covering you know in the next next session wherein we'll touch upon the basics of the financial management and then we'll try to capitalize that and of course build it on on it in terms of you know really taking that to the level that we want is that clear yes sir was it something something that really really got into you in terms of consuming the content that we really had i'll be happy my friend to really chat on if there is anything that i can help you out or anything that you would want me to really talk on i'll be happy to really chat on to that so thank you very much for joining in my friend we will be seeing you next week in another session till then this pankaj dingra signing off